Everybody, welcome to this final study on the sensor wars. And I'm reluctant to say final study because it's really going to be something that we're going to be studying in many facets as we continue on in this ministry. This is the most important message to go out to the world is the return of Christ and, and whom you are preparing to meet. This glory that we are about to go face to face without a veil what preparation, what do we need to know uh, in the pre-advent of his glory? And how is God to prepare his people to face his glory? Now, one of the most important things that we're going to understand is, it, as, is that it matters how we relate to God's glory. How do we manage the glory that he has imparted? and how this is an ever-increasing radiance that dawns upon the dark abyss of our mind. How does this glory, you know, form itself, and how do we relate to God's glory? Now, God says that when he returns, that, uh, that he will return, and that we will be changed in a moment, in a twinkle of an eye, but it's not talking about a, quote, um, character change in the sense that we're going to just go ahead and be completely the face of evil. And then when he shows up, he's going to presto us into that. He just says um, they will be, quote, recognizable sons and daughters. And it's very fascinating. You get into Colossians, you get into 1 John, that when he returns in the clouds of glory, you get the real sense that there's likeness to God because we beheld his glory. By beholding, you become transformed and changed and it's imperceivable because we are constantly in a deconstruction of our pride and self-sufficiency. And we see the loathsome parts of ourselves. And God does say, look and live and behold me and lift your face and I will shine my countenance upon you. Do not despair. But he doesn't let us go the apostasy or going off the road into presumption, pride, or fascination with our own false and twisted version of glory. Like, God keeps all these great balances for us. And so there is an ever-increasing understanding of our sinfulness, the sinfulness of our nature, and just how corrupt and just how perverted and just how distorted our views are that God has got to constantly chasten us with the rod of giving us real reflection to ourself. But he's telling us not to despair. He's saying to look and to live and that I am your sin-bearing Savior, right? So this is all fundamental, but we get confused in the walk. We become uh, strangely enchanted. <clears throat> now, what we're going to talk about here and what we've been talking about throughout this study is the wicked mind, that we look upon God and we see his glory, we see his goodness, we see the attributes of his vulnerability in his glory, and then we think like a predator or like a bully thinks, oh, here's his weak spot. Here's where God can be controlled or manipulated. It's the classic bully in the relationship that looks upon the vulnerabilities of someone and thinks the first word that comes to their mind, exploit. How do I exploit this? How do I use this to my advantage? And that is pure sin nature, right? That is the Lucifer mind shift in which he was facing the glory of God and he saw a lamb slain. He saw the suffering Lord. He saw the caregiver. He saw how God is anxious with our well-being. And he, quote, despised. Remember, we were warned in Romans chapter 2. Paul says, do you despise the goodness of God? Because it is the goodness of God that causes you to repent. The goodness of God should not inform your mind, oh, look, God is weak. God is vulnerable. God's going to tolerate me uh, doing this. Therefore, I don't fear him anymore. And then you kind of go into this, I'm going to sit upon the throne. I'm going to rule, et cetera. Now, to only see that attribute in blatant evil is missing the point. God says it starts out with coveting. It starts out with the smallest ember of the flame of your soul that, that flickers off from the fire and uh, starts an entire forest fire that James chapter 3 says informs your mind and your mouth. And you start to go about creating proselytes after the son of hell that you have become. 
you're making sure that everyone drinks of that cup and eats of that fruit. You start to convince other people that this is a good thing. And we try to find confidence and security in numbers to convince people that the rebellion against God that we have partaken in is a good idea and we should convince others to do that. So what's important to understand here is, and this is the final study on this study, is how dangerous is it to do this? And we've gone throughout this study of Nadab and Abihu and Eli's sons and All throughout, we've looked at the danger of doing this. We're directly going to look at Lucifer today, and then we're going to move back and look at ourselves. With every study, we're supposed to be studying Judas and then study ourselves. We're supposed to be studying King Saul and then study ourselves. We're supposed to be studying Lucifer even and then study ourselves instead of trying to find comfort like the Pharisee where the publican came up to worship God. And he found comfort in turning and comparing himself, right? The same thing Peter turned and he compared himself. And God calls this spiritual cannibalism. Compare yourself to God. And then when there's stories in the Bible, don't be first focused on how that applies to somebody else. We first have to really say, how is this informing God's own examination of my own heart? How is God searching the reins of my own internal process, my own soul, my own comforting, self-comforting narratives that may in the end beguile me. Remember, sin is a deceiver. You are betrayed by sin. You were fooled by the narratives and the language of sin, the self-soothing of sin. And there's all kinds of self-soothing language out there in which, unfortunately, we take shelter in And that is, unfortunately, a shelter that will be destroyed by God, and we will be left naked. And it is a false um, abiding place, a false place to abide. So let's go go into the study, because what I want to do is look at the glory of God and really see the consequences as to, how do I say this nicely? Uh, The consequences as to wrestling with what you see. You see, we see the glory of God, and then on strange second thought, at first we're always in awe. We're like, whoa. But what I always talk about is the second thought, the bouncing thought, the echo. When you kind of gather yourself together and you straighten your tie and you go, whoa, okay. And then you start the narrative on your walk away. Everyone was blown away when Jesus overturned the money changer tables. They were in fear of the wrath of God, no doubt about it. But what was the narrative on the walk away when they felt safe to, quote, murmur? Same thing. The children of Israel saw the glory of God in parting the Red Sea, destroying Pharaoh and his armies. They could have never done it in a fleshy human revolution. But God overthrew the entire empire. And then he spoke from Mount Sinai, and they're all in awe. So what happened? Second thought. See, we get into the second thought. So how dangerous is Or how much are we to watch over or how diligent are we to be when we feel safe on, quote, second thought? What are we to remind ourselves when we see the glory of God? We see even the glory of God in his vulnerability, in his Achilles heel, in him saying, here's my soft spot. I love you guys. I'll be very reluctant to destroy you. And Lucifer saw that. When he's a lamb slain from the foundation of the world before there is ever sin, Lucifer looked upon that and thought, he's got a weak spot. On I'm, I'm, I'm touched and fascinated. A little tear probably fell from his little Luciferian eye. And then he's like, wait a minute. That's a point of exploitation. People that are narcissists fall in love with Codependents, because the codependent is running around being caregivers and being uh, attending to needs and nurturing. And then they're touched and they're just fascinated. They fall in love with that person. Then on second thought, I can exploit this. I can control this. I can manipulate this. We all have to watch our second thought and be careful that what we saw, we don't forget that it's a dangerous thing to play with that. Very dangerous. In fact, 
God says it's so dangerous that he can illustrate it as to if you've done it unto the least of these, believe me, you did it to me. You did it to me. All right. Let's look into our study. Let's get into this because I want to get into this whole. What about the glory of God? Is it dangerous? Is the glory of God dangerous? And is it a trap to you, to us, to Lucifer even, Judas, that when you see God's weakness and vulnerability, do you beguile yourself and say, this is something to control and to exploit for my glory? God's trying to remind us, I'm not fooled. I'm not mocked. You're not going to play this weird game and think in the end it's going to work out for you. You should check yourself before you wreck yourself. The second Thessalonians chapter two, verse eight says, and then the lawless one will be revealed whom the Lord will consume with what? The breath of his mouth, his word, the Holy Spirit. What? And then destroy with what? The brightness of his coming. Is the glory of God dangerous? It's a sharp two-edged sword, but it also is it feet of bronze and burning, of trampling, of doom and destruction. Well, let's look at the brightness of his glory again. Habakkuk chapter three, verse, because we didn't know Nadab and Abihu are, are cautionary tales. And there's lots of cautionary tales, right? There is Achan. We, we have cautionary tales of the people of God that saw his glory and decided to have second thoughts. Habakkuk three, four through six says, and his brightness was as a, the light, and he had horns coming out of his hand. That's fascinating because we know that horns represent power and authority and dominion. And there was the hiding of his power. And what's, what's in his hands? Nailed, pierced marks, the vulnerability of God. And there's this likelihood to fall into the trap of thinking because God is gentle. God is burden-bearing. God is like an animal bearing an ox. God long suffers. God really has mercy. God is sympathetic and compassionate. God is touched with the feelings of our infirmities. That somehow that those nail pierced hands and in the violation of that is of low to little consequence. But delayed justice does not mean that that justice is not shrieking, raving, severe. Before him went pestilence, burning coals went forth at his feet. It sounds like the return of Christ. It sounds like the sharp two-edged sword coming from his mouth. It sounds like the feet of burning bronze set on brass. It sounds like a fiery stream issuing before him. It sounds like his eyes or his lamps scanning and searching the very thoughts and intent of the soul and bringing it out and bringing you to justice. He stood and measured the earth. Uh-oh, we have a measuring rod, and all is measured according to what? His hand breath. That's interesting. He measures everything according to himself. That's the measurement of life and righteousness and worthiness, whether you should be in the kingdom of God. He beheld and drove asunder the nations. Well, wow, that sounds pretty serious. One man against the population of the world that is at war with him. Those odds don't sound good. Everyone is attacking the lamb, a widow, tiny widow, wham. And the everlasting mountains were scattered. You thought there was permanence here in this world, that Satan and his seven mountains are going to rule and are immovable and immutable. Perpetual hills did, did bow. And throughout the scripture, it says, did melt as wax, yielded to the glory of God. What is the proud heart of man going to do in his pretentious, presumptuous, defiant rebellion as dried thorns and as dried thistles? His ways, his ways are everlasting. Uh-oh, we have some burning wax coming up here. Psalms. 68 verses 2 and 8 says, as smoke is driven away. Wow, he considers this world nothing more than a puff of smoke. We consider it like this very solid place to do our business. 
So drive them away as wax melteth before the fire. So let the wicked perish, what? At the presence of God. What should we understand about being in the presence of God? Verse 8 says, the earth shook, the heavens also dropped at the presence of God. What should be our, what did Isaiah do? What does anybody, what does John do? What does Daniel do? What does Abraham do? What does Moses do? Even Sinai itself was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. So is it a thing to trifle with the glory of God and consider it of small consequence that, as I said, when we get comfortable, when we don't feel the excited heat of it all and we walk away, what's the narrative? What's the chatter? What permissions are you giving yourself because you walked away unscathed? He gave you, is it just a scare tactic? It's mommy's little threats of getting paddled on your little behind, but he, she decides not to spank your hiney. And then the little deviant brain walks away with those little curled up grinchy kind of smirks. Be careful. It's not cute to God. It's tragic. <laughs> and we'll see, because it's very fascinating when you really get into this study. God tests you according to you getting a front row seat to the glory, and then he releases you, and then now you're tested. Now you're tested. What do you do when you feel safe from the threat and the wrath of that glory? What goes in your head that's the beginning of your test. That's when you pull out your diary and, and your notebook and you start writing your notes. You start logging. What did I do with the glory of God after I felt safe and I was released from consequences? What was my, quote, comeback narrative? You know how we love to have comebacks and arguments? We have to have the last word. You see, under God's authority, he's saying don't have the last word. And the last word ism. Right? We have an addiction to rebuttal everything. Mary, Mary, quite contrary. Oh, yeah? Well, I have my version. Then we have to edit everything, and everything has to be – That that's why you see it in politics now. Everyone's going back for, no, what about my version? What about my version? Yeah, it's the same thing, but it needs to be my version. Well, what about my version? I want my name on it. No, your name can't be on it. They're fighting for who's ever version, whoever gets to have their fingerprint, their stank is on it when it's all said and done. God says you better be careful of that quality in your dipped in sin world mentality. Presence of God, Revelation 14, verse 10 says, the same shall drink the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture. Sounds pretty intense. It sounds like the wrath of God. Sounds like the destruction of the wicked. Sounds like the lake of fire stuff. Into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire brimstone in what? The presence of the holy angels in the presence of the lamb. The proximity of God is the wrath of God. His glory is the wrath. The wicked are destroyed in his presence, not away from him. Away from God is your preservation as far as the wicked is concerned. You better hope God is far away. You better hope Christ doesn't come. You better hope God stays away because proximity is going to be your destruction. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31 says, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. See, so this is the danger, and this is kind of what I keep bringing up in the studies, is nobody's in greater danger of culpability but of severity of God's wrath more than God's people. God's people are in the most danger. And you see that throughout the history of this thing we call creatures dealing with God. The arch sinner, the, quote, reigning king of sin— the champ of sin was closest to the throne. We keep talking about this. Shabbat Shalom, my dear brother. And so no, if you go throughout scriptures from beginning to end, primarily the scriptures are focused on warning who? The Gentiles or warning God's people? There is warning to the Gentiles. 
But the warning is there's light coming to you. Be careful of that light because my people have blown it. They've received an, a desolation after desolation after desolation, ruin after ruin after ruin because of their abomination. What's the abomination? To twist the glory of God after you've seen a clear picture of the glory of God, our iniquity to bend and to twist and to turn it into our own image is the great super sin. And so God's people weirdly have it in their head that they're immune from because they're in a special place from the wrath of God. But that is a false cocoon because God keeps showing that you are actually the most culpable, culpable. You are the most accountable. You have more responsibility because God knows that you had falsehoods dispelled. You had ignorance. Um, you've been dispelled of ignorance and clarity has been brought to you. Now to re-muddy the waters with your own narrative and your own thinking is the beginning of bringing a, quote, trespass offering, which is I did it in my ignorance, to now you better be dealing with a sin offering. I did it knowingly, and nothing is more dangerous than to know the truth and then to warp and bend the truth to serve your selfish needs. Not even needs, your selfish paradigm of life in which you call whatever you do to exploit things and people and circumstances and situations, you call them needs. Well, I got to put food on the table. I got to get my power. Whatever it is we use to kind of sanction to justify the wicked means in which we, quote, accumulate or heap up our little power source, our little power structure, our little power center. And God knows we can fool other, but, but the most dangerous person, but the most effective person in doing that is someone who has seen the glory of God with super clarity. We're talking about you were on the pavement. You saw the glory of God. The most wicked people you'll ever find this earth are ex-people of God, ex-people who have really seen the glory of God. You will get no greater manipulator and no greater effective manipulator than that person. And the lower the temptation, the higher that you get, It be, what am I trying to say is that the temptation becomes very shriekingly subtle, but very powerful because you're just going to be better at nuance and subtlety and able to hide it and cover it up and cover your tracks and to distance yourself from you being accountable because you've learned more of those kinds of skills as you go because you've learned the subtlety and the nuance of really pulling strings. It is dangerous, dangerous. So let's look at some more scripture. Let's really get into our study because we are to watch that process of, remember the word censor, and I don't know if you guys remember this from the study, even the word censor means to destroy. It means to basically turn to dust, turn to ashes, to destroy with fire. And so it's it's what brings the fire, what brings the destruction. See, in the Hebrew, everything, there's not a noun, there's just verbs. Verbs is the action around it. So what does a sensor do? What's it's doing? It brings the coals near, brings the fire near. So it's the same word for destruction. All right, here we go. So let's get into this Lucifer brain, because this is going to be, our our final study is going to be, we're going to be doing a case study on Lucifer. We've been, but we're coming up close here. We're just going to study Lucifer. We might finish it with an application to us and the people of God and the church of God and the harlot, which is the people of God that have become a harlot. That's the harlot of scripture. We just think it's some, some offshoot pagan harlot out there somewhere. No, no, no. It's us that turn into harlots. We're the most accountable. We're the most culpable we're the one with the brazen forehead that hardened our forehead at what we know and seen of the glory of God. And we decided to twist it into what about me? Let me get mine. Let me go get my money. I got my money on my mind, my mind on my money. 
Here we go. Second Thessalonians chapter two, one, three through 14, it says, now brethren concerning the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and our gathering together to him, we ask you something. With this meeting at the tent of the tabernacle at the door, in which all will face the glory of God, God always gives a breakdown. He always quotes so much more as you see the day, the day in which we are all gonna be face to face unveiled before God. God talks to us. Before his advent, there should be a great proclamation going into this entire world to prepare to meet your God. And that is so. The book of Revelation talks about it, but it's all throughout scripture. It is always this eschatological picture that God wants to have a counseling session first with us before we destroy ourselves with our giving ourselves permission to do exactly what I've been talking about go and to rethink and to restructure your thoughts because at first you're blown away by the glory of God and you made all these promises to God. All that you said we shall do. <laughs> I'm so sorry, God. And boogers coming out of our nose. <sighs> Making all these promises, but then there's zero follow through, right? So God's going to give us a counsel like he is right now. You got, no, no, no. you got to watch yourself on your walk away. When you are talking to yourself again, when you're walking away, that's the part I'm wanting you to pay attention to because that's gonna be your unraveling. That's gonna be what's gonna destroy you. And make sure that you learn from Lucifer. And if you don't learn from Lucifer, make sure you learn from Eve or learn from Cain or learn from Lamech or learn from whoever, Ham. Nimrod, whoever, how many examples were given for our admonition upon whom the ends of the world have come in which we could say, wait a minute, learn from Judas. Oh, like how, let's keep stacking them up. It's the same lesson. Verse three, let no one deceive you by any means. It's not your brother, it's not your sister that's saying, hey, Come along. Let's twist the very glory of God so we can have ourselves a good time. Let's find a bunch of people that's going to agree with us. That'll keep us from the wrath of God. What does the scripture say about that person? For that day, the day, the Yom Kippur day, will not come unless the falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. What are sons of perdition? The very mentality I'm telling you about, not just the, yes, we have, quote, representative uh, picture of doing that in an ecclesiastical form, which is the Roman Catholic Church. It is your classic whore walking away from God and then calling herself by his name. Got it. Institutional. But should we on the Day of Atonement all ourselves go through our own examination process? whether we be in the way or whether we be out of the way, that we have our own version of this great perdition. Are we identified with the man of sin, even though we don't have membership to a denomination that would be, quote, condemnable? Two in the field. Two at the mill. Two in the bed. Be careful. Careful what's here. Remember Lot's wife. It's what's in your mind. It's what's in your heart. You might be coming out of Sodom and Gomorrah, but your heart is back in Sodom and Gomorrah. Look at Achan. How many examples do we need? Look at Judas. Who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God. When God speaks, that is God. When God speaks his authority in his word, that is God. That is his authority. That is his command. That is his lordship. His word is perfectly a representation of his personhood. What he speaks is as so as who he is. That's why God can swear an oath by himself, and it's as good as God is. Or all that is worshipped, worship, worthy is the lamb, worthy is him who speaketh, Worthy is God who speaks from his throne. 
No, no, no. I want to twist the word of God and I want it to suit my own glory. Be careful on your second thought that gives you permission in your head to do that, but you see no apparent consequences. What? It's not raining. There's never been rain before. Wait a minute. What about this temple? This temple is a temple that was built and cannot be destroyed. Careful. And your presumption in which we think we're fortified, again, Leviathan thinks the same, same thing. He's all armored up. How is God going to destroy him? So that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. We clearly see the Lucifer brain. And we see that in Isaiah. We see that in Ezekiel. When Lucifer is directly described, and there's a rundown, we're going to go through those verses. But this is not foreign to, to us. I only care about speaking to the church of God right now. I'll be honest with you. I'm obsessed with God's people as God is. I'm obsessed with God's church and them receiving primarily the warning, the house of God, first and foremost and preeminently because God is. I would rather chasten God's people than try to chasten a world that doesn't know God. That is the weight of scripture. If you want to look at the pie chart, you will see that scripture is primarily obsessed with God's people that are in a clear knowledge of God, and then they go and they do this. Yes, there is condemnation to the Philistines, and yes, there's condemnation to Tyre and Sidon and Damascus. Yes, there's condemnation to um, Babylon and to Persia and to Greece and to Rome. But why? Why are they being chastised? Why isn't China being chastised? Why was the Philippines being chastised? Why wasn't Russia being chastised? Why wasn't Java? Why wasn't Indonesia being chastised in scripture? Why wasn't the natives of South America being chastised? Why wasn't Africa, the southern part of Africa, being chastised? Because they weren't in proximity to the glory of God. God was warning the Gentiles, be careful when light shines. God's people are to be, quote, these bearers of this light. Like Lucifer, they were light bearers. Be careful when you are a light bearer that you're the most danger as you are in the closest of proximity. And then those that radiate out that are also in proximity of that glory, their accountability is likewise. So if I hand my people that are light bearers into the arms of Babylon, you become accountable. If I hand my light bearers or my light and people that, that are the keepers of the oracles, and you are now in the arms of Persia and Meda, be careful. You should learn from my people. How many times did, was um, nations looking by and seeing the destruction of God's people shaking their head and hissing, saying, why do they go against their own God? That seems crazy to us. We would never do that to Dagon. We would never do that to Baal. We would never do that to Molech. We would never do it to our God. Why do they give themselves permission to do it? We'd never do it to Beelzebul. Why are these guys going against their God? That's a scary idea. And many times when you saw that the pagan kings such as Nineveh or even Nebuchadnezzar, you saw repentance when they actually saw the glory of God. What is wrong with us that we have presumed upon this? The only reason that they were, quote, ever chastised or ever there was a condemnation was proximity to light. Who has the greatest proximity? Who has the most light? Who is God most desperately and clearly and most loudly warning? Those who are in the closest proximity to light. Lucifer, Nadab and Abihu, Cain. Cain had lots of light. They actually thought he was a son. I've obtained a man, Hebrew. I've obtained the man. What man? The man, the seed man, the one that they thought was going to defeat Satan. And crush his head and have his heel bruised. He really thought he was the Messiah. He was given the full story, and he started to become self-fascinated. And he hated the fact that Abel had an offering that did not bring glory to, to Cain and brought glory to the Messiah that was going to come. And then he was very, quote, onerous over that and became a super Lucifer, right? He started the killing spree. He, be, he began the mass killing. 
And from that point on, just count the bodies that have been murdered. Allah, King, Cain, and the sons of Cain. Let's continue on. <coughs> Showing himself that he is God, which is having the power of life and death in your hand. Do you not remember that when I was still with you, I told you these things? Be careful. Be careful. Because Paul was there as a minister of light. Christ is the light of the world, and he's bringing it to the Gentiles. And we know that the whole ministration of the Messiah was to be a light unto the Gentiles, right? That he's going to be a light, Galilee, and that the government of God shall be upon his shoulders. That's the, that's the whole prophecy about the Messiah, by the way. He would come from Galilee. He would be a Nazarite. And he would come and bring light to the Gentiles. So be careful with that light. Be careful that you don't twist it and that you don't turn it into something in which you yourself, quote, showing yourself to be God because you want to be, quote, worshipped. God's people, most danger of doing that. <clears throat> so it says in verse six, and now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time? Let me read on and we'll explain this. For the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. Only he who, who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. Who's restraining? Who's the he? Well, <coughs> it depends on the translations that you get as to who's going to attribute who to what. But the reason Paul's talking this way is he's not talking about one party and the other party. He's talking about this is what happens. You have this quote. Now you know what is restraining that he may be revealed in his own time. God restrains, but also Satan veils himself for the mystery of lawlessness is already at work. And he who now restrains will do so until he is taken out of the way. So God is restraining until God is taken out of the way. Basically, this is just it. He's talking about the Day of Atonement, that everything's going to be unveiled. And what happens is when you have light, light liberates. Light unrestrains. Light takes off shackles. Light also, when even a robber or a thief that's in the house, when you flip the lights on, you go in the Old Testament, says that he becomes a killer. That's why God says, behold, I'm like a thief in the night. When I show up and the lights flip on, I become aggressive and I kill you. Be careful that uh, I don't show up as a thief of the night and then you discover and it becomes a scene of total chaos and horror. Because we know that when a thief is discovered while they are robbing and now the lights are on and that you are now going to be a witness, they're going to try to kill all witnesses, right? Well, this is a very macabre and scary way to look at the idea that when lights are turned on, everything's revealed and the restraints are off. Same thing even with God. At some point, God's light so shines that he is no longer going to restrain. That when Lucifer, when the lights are shined upon him, he's no longer. He's going to be loosed from his, right, from his chains. Why should he hide anymore? The lights are all on. And he's just going to come full out. This is what the Day of Atonement is a picture of an ever-increasing light, ever-increasing revelation. The more the light comes, the less the restraining. And there is this idea to take each other away. That's Day of Atonement language. It's the removal of, the rolling off of something, the casting off of something. A kapoor. The idea of you are taking something and you are rolling it off onto something else. It's the day of covering, but it's the day of rolling off or casting off or this idea of putting off. It's a putting on and a putting off. It's just kind of a, it's just using this language of the day of atonement in which when, be careful what you do with light because you're going to start seeing these inner dynamics take place now on open stage. And when the lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord will consume with the breath of his mouth and destroy with the brightness of his coming, his glory, the coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan with all power, signs, and lying wonders. 
this is what you see all throughout scripture in which now Satan comes full out and he is running in competition with God. Just like you saw with Moses, with Pharaoh. Now comes the who has power, who has authority. Hey, sister, good to see you. And so here you go. You have the same thing that happened with Pharaoh. All of a sudden you have the standoff. It's the same thing. It becomes a God war. You see it in the book of Revelation chapter 13. What does the image power do? It's signs and wonders and showing its display of power. And he who keeps the, uh, he who has the mark or he who has the seal and those that will receive not the mark, he has power and authority and dominion. And you have this dominion war. And it's out in the open. It's Pharaoh and Moses. It's David and the Amalekites. It becomes David and Goliath. At some point, the veil is lifted, and you see who the key players are, and it's going to be Satan versus Christ. And it's going to be a gauntlet as to the throwdown as to who has dominion and authority. Be careful that what you're doing in the secret private places of your heart, you are already pledging of allegiance to whoever your Lord is. And he says there comes a point where the veil is lifted, and all of these inner dynamics are shown for what they are. And guess what? The kakukarachas are going to scatter towards whoever their Lord is. When God reveals your sin, are you going to flee to God? I hope so. Or when God lifts up the veil and turns on the lights, are you going to flee to your Lord that you've been secretly feasting on and serving and bowing down to? And that's where you're going to have a situation. You saw it with the, like a COVID thing. It clearly cut the lines of conservative and liberals. It's very fascinating how what was once secret, all of a sudden overnight, the veil is lifted, and all of a sudden you see these allegiances that you thought it was all blended and murky and mixed. No, 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 no. God knows that when the veil is lifted, the lights are turned on, all allegiances will be revealed, and you will see a desperate clamor for this joining yourself to your Lord. So verse 10 says, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish, those who wish to live in dreamland, those who are buying into the lie, who continue to prefer the delusions, strong delusion, they don't care. There comes a point in your nihilism where your self-nihilistic kind of way in which you've abandoned yourself over to your life of self-delusion in which you don't even care. You don't even care for the truth. It's just about how long you can get away with your delusion and you'll push your delusion until you're killed. So it says right here, with all unrighteous deception among those who perish because they did not receive the love of the truth that they might be saved. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they would believe the lie. God is merciful. He's merciful. How is he merciful? Doesn't it say in the book of Proverbs, give wine to those that are dying? What's the strong delusion? This sounds really strange what I'm about to say, but I, it's biblical. <coughs> God doses them with an anesthetizing. They feel no pain. They're like a harlot. There's no conscience. They sear their conscience. You know what tortures you? Do you know what tortures God's people? Do you know what tortures people? Their conscience. What happens to those that people that have a conscience suffer more in this life? People that have very, like, that are vulnerable, are, are sensitized in kind of against sin, against hurting God. Even at some point, you're going to have to numb yourself. That's what the word stiff neck means. It literally means that you develop a um, an immunity against a sting. God keeps warning, quit kicking against the pricks, against the thorns, against these, these things, because what will happen is you'll start to numb in the process. You won't feel the, th the, the hedge of thorns that God puts around you that is supposed to be keeping you sensitive and pulling you back away from such a path. That you could become such a rebel-minded soul that you keep going against the thorns and the thistles until you don't feel the stings anymore. You gain what's called the harlot's forehead. You are numb. And so that's why he likens it into being intoxicated and you have the golden cup and you're not touched and you're 
touched by no pain or sorrow, no woe. You know, you don't care that you've crucified Christ afresh, that you've just murdered your, quote, cosmic husband. You don't care. And what's bizarre is what's strange to think is, so why would God, quote, in the end, for this reason, they don't have a love of the truth anymore, right? They don't care that they perish, that they don't care to be saved. For this reason, God will send them strong delusion that they should believe the lie full on, handed over to, drunk. And you see this in the book of Revelation, chapter 17 and 18, drunk, super drunk. Go to the Proverbs, go to throughout scripture. What does drunkness, what does it help you to do? To feel no pain. I pierced my hand on this and that, all through the scripture. It's, it's mocking that person. The redness of eye and et cetera. And I'm going to go back and do it again. I don't care. I didn't receive the consequences. The only person to survive the car crash was the inebriate, was the rubber boy. He went through the, the front windshield and barely got a scratch. Everyone else was killed and they were stone cold sober. Why? Just didn't care. Just gave himself over to the powerful dynamics in that in the car wreck. He was probably giggling when he was going through the windshield. It sounds strange, but even in his wrath, God is merciful. Yeah, you're going to be sent strong delusion. You're going to be given wine because you have been slated to die. That scares me. And what's weird is to the wicked, who knows that they're not going to change, who has set their mind against God, that comforts them. But I do want to share this. <clears throat> That's in this wrath. The strong delusion is at the coming of Christ. What's fascinating is in the book of Revelation chapter 20, the second resurrection where everyone is accountable, everybody is stone cold sober. Everyone has a clear conscience. It is with weeping and gnashing of teeth there's no anesthetizing. It's only at the return of Christ in this last generation of human beings in which they are moving into the great cosmic conflict against God's people and God, in essence, in these last days. They get the anesthetizing. But they're going to be stone cold sober when they wake up on resurrection morning a thousand years later. Don't envy the wicked thinking that they're going to get off scot-free. Now, they're anesthetized for a last great conflict before the return of Christ. Yeah, that does happen. But they get full accountability upon the second resurrection where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. There is nothing at all that is going to buffer the pain when they deal with every idle word, every vain thought, every process in which they have engaged and entered into their rebellion against God, against thee and thee alone have I sinned. And all of a sudden, all of that anesthetizing quality, all is a million miles away from you. And in the end, of course, yes, you will be brought to dust, to powder, to nothing. You will be as no more. But that is no comfort for the period that you are alive because for you, it feels like an eternity because of then you just perish. You're not thinking, oh, I perished. No, you just die in the knowledge of your rebellion against God. So is it a serious thing? Is it a horrible thing to fall into the hands of a living God that is accounting your every thought, your every intent, your very motives, your very inner processes that he's tracking. This is the way it is. And God warns his people who are most anesthetized, who are most presumptuous, who most give themselves permission to presume against the glory of God, and then to go out and to use the name of God and say, the Lord saith, and the Lord says, I haven't said so. Why are you going in my name? Is that in Christian ministry now? Yes. Is that in all biblical ministries, be it Jewish, be it Christian, be it Catholic, be it Protestant? Yes. 
be it evangelical, yes. Even those that are commandment keepers, yes. Yeah, that's a huge danger. That they may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. It's not just gross sin. Righteousness is the glory of God that you wanted to twist it to your own sentimental postmodern little narrative bends that are sentimentalized and tokenized. Dangerous. But we are bound to give thanks to God always for you, brethren, beloved, by the Lord, because God from the beginning chose you for salvation through sanctification by the Spirit and belief in the truth, in the truth as it is in Christ, to which he called you by our gospel for the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are to look upon his glory. We are not to twist his glory. We are not to change his glory. We aren't to be the um, the PR uh, agents of God having to make his glory more palpable. We're not Rob Bell. We're not sitting there trying to quaintly put God together in a nice little package in this kind of a way. We don't manipulate all of that. People do that all the time in their postmodern story time narrative, which is entire churches. Story time church. Be careful. So here we go. Let's get into the Lucifer brain. Let's examine Lucifer deeply. Let's give ourselves full permission to stare into his soul and to be appropriately horrified and then let's turn that portrait to ourselves and see if we're matching up to it this is the importance of these teachings verse 12 says of isaiah 14 how you are fallen from heaven O lucifer lucifer is what light bearer he had a ministry it's called light bearer ministry and that he was there to bring the glory of God, these little beautiful shafts of light from God's throne to the people. And then he started to be the great storyteller. And somehow you became fascinated with the messenger. Angel worship. Son of the morning, the morning star, the dawn, the one who is bringing this cracking open of light and sharing. He's like, oh, tell me another story, Lucifer. How you are cut down from the ground, you who weaken the nations? He's a great storyteller. How did he do that? For you have said in your heart, ah, the old in your heart. Here we go. On second thought, be careful of that internal dialogue in which you think you're getting away with being a grand manipulator. Something in which you have decided to exploit this position that you're in for admiration of you as the messenger. Super dangerous. I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation amongst God's people. What are you doing using the gathering and the assembly of God's people to be your place to shine? What do you mean? I'm not allowed to do that in church. I'm not allowed to see that as my audience for my glory to shine as a messenger of God. Of course, I'm using the name of God, but in my heart, it's for me to shine. That's bad. Yeah, that's called Luciferian. On the farthest sides of the north. The hidden sides, the word north in Hebrew literally means like hidden or secret chambers. That's where Christ says, if God's in the secret chambers or if God is in the wilderness, he's using the term north and south. But God comes from east to the west as the sun rises and all this stuff. You see this type of it. So the hidden rocky crags up in the mountains where the storms all come and the cold winds blow in the sides of the north in which you are going up to to the throne of the mysterious God, and then you come down with messages, you better be careful that you forget the wrath of God that comes upon those who decides to take that light. 
and to somehow slightly bend it enough to bring glory to the messenger. Every angel knows the danger of this. Every angel says, do not bow down before me. Do not put me in that situation. Do not put me in the class of beings that allow people to bow down to the messenger. Paul knew this. Silas knew this. I believe Barnabas. They all knew this. They all knew how detrimental. They all knew how precarious, how super, super, super dangerous that is. But we in these days, no way. It's all about messenger worship now. It's all about being fascinated with the very vessel that brings you this light in which you associate that light with that vessel. You had better cleanse yourself of that messenger. From the sides of the north, from the mysterious place where they're going, what did you see when you went up to the mountains, messenger? When you went up to the fiery mountain where there was the, the, the fiery stones, what did you see, messenger? And then you come down cracking out this knowledge and they're all saying, messenger, messenger, you must be a special messenger. They're like, oh, yeah, special messenger. I'm special. I'm Steve Jobs of the Great North Mountain, and I come down with my black turtleneck and my little Britney Spears mics, and I'm telling you the next great thing. Verse 14. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Be careful. This is in your heart. This takes place. God doesn't say that everyone who watches you do this is detecting it, and it's blatantly obvious. The congregation is fooled. The assembly is fooled. The attendees and the pew warmers are fooled. The church members are fooled. The children of God are fooled. Yet you shall be brought down to Sheol. You'll be brought down to your own Black sucking hole of wantonness. Yeah, literal Sheol in which God will destroy you and you'll be brought down to the grave. But there's a Sheol that the great Sheol in which God destroys the wicked is connecting to the Sheol of your own appetites, of your own insatiable, vacuous thirst vacuum for glory. That's never satisfying. That's why you're so competitive, right? That's why you're so threatened by anyone that bears the glory of God. You think they're taking from your sheer shine. The lowest depths of the pit. Those who see you will gaze at you because they thought you were super amazing and you certainly promoted yourself that way, right, Lucifer? And consider you saying, is this the man who made the earth tremble? who shook kingdoms, who was the mighty presenter? The guy bringing the torch down from the mountain, breaking off all this light? Who made the world as a wilderness and destroyed its cities and who did not open the house of, of his prisoners? These are control freaks. These are destroyers. These are those that promise liberty. I mean, Lucifer promising liberty, but only brings destruction. Promising great reform and great light and great, hey, look, I have a beautiful new way in which I'm going to present. You have this now with the postmodern church, by the way. You have all the apologists for the postmodernism, the new God, the super ultra inclusive open source emergent God never judges, brings all things into the fold. New light. All right, let's hit, boop. let's turn the channel to Ezekiel. We're going to go from Isaiah to Ezekiel. Went from channel Paul, and then we switch it to channel Isaiah. Then let's go to channel Ezekiel. Let's see if they're all bearing the same testimony and all using Lucifer as the model, the, quote, proto-sinner, the chief of sinners. Son of man, Ezekiel 28, 2 through 19. Say to the prince of Tyre, why Tyre? Because of the close proximity. This is where Sidon and Tyre is where you have 
Jezebel coming from? In other words, all right, the I'm a queen narc land. Be careful because Tyre and Sidon is where Solomon got all of the materials outside of what David had stored up for, and you had Hiram who was coming from Tyra and from Sidon, helping with the construction of the temple. So they, in turn, got a big dose of God's light by being those that contributed to the temple. Well, now they're culpable. They are now getting this Luciferian brain of self-exaltation. But he's going to talk about Lucifer and saying, be careful, human agent, son of man. Say to the prince of Tyra, thus says the Lord God, because your heart is lifted up and you say, I am a God. I sit in the seat of gods. It sounds like Second Thessalonians, doesn't it? Boy, do creatures have a propensity to do this? This is automatic. This is a knee-jerk reaction. This is our reflex inside of our soul. Paul says it in Romans 8. He says, the carnal man, the sinful man, the man that he has to live with, that we have to live with in this fallen nature, this is natural reflex. We don't have to try to do this. <clears throat> we just have to be unguarded and unchecked. And that's why God is so severe on being watchful and guarded and diligent in the guardianship and the stewardship of the own propensities of our own soul. Not for one second can we be trusted. That's why presumption is so dangerous. Unwatchfulness is so dangerous. A runaway kind of narrative is super dangerous. In the midst of the seas, yet you are a man and not a God. And we're like, no, come on. I am ascending the throne. Don't get in my way. Though you set your heart as the heart of a God. <laughs> we're all sitting there going, yeah, Prince of Tyra, meh. Behold, you are wiser than Daniel, who never presumed. There is no secret that can be hidden from you. You know everything, know-it-all. You sit as a know-it-all. You sneer as a know-it-all. You speak in condescending tones as a know-it-all. You suck on your teeth like you know-it-all. You sit there as the resident skeptic with this I know face. With your wisdom and your understanding, you have gained riches for yourself and gathered gold and silver into your treasuries. By the way, when you want to really get into this Lucifer study around this trafficking and how he sells his wares, and is if he's selling and you're buying and you subscribe to this, quote, enrichment chain in which he has produced in this world in which he could set up a little glory stand for yourself in which you can partake in this Luciferian glow and the rewards of it in this world. Go ahead. Be Bob Dylan. Get your goodies. Go join the parade of the pomp and the pretty and the presumptuous, pretentious, the beautiful ones. And by your great wisdom and trade and how you traffic and how you play and interplay and how you do your kind of exchange process of your wheels than wheels, you have increased your riches and your heart is lifted up because of your riches, your success, how you've enriched yourself with just money. No, it might not even be money. It could be glory. It could be charm. It could be enchantment that people have with you. It could be people's fear and trembling of you. He who destroys the nations. People fear you. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because you have set your what? Your heart as the heart of a God. Well, we're back to this again. On second thought, when you see the glory of God, are you thinking of merchandising that? Right? Becoming a den of thieves? When you turn away from the fear and the trembling and the awe and the realization and not to play with the glory of God, and you turn away and say, wait a minute, I'm not dead, though. And then you start to scheme and you test the waters a little bit. 
And you're thinking, God hasn't destroyed me. God hasn't punished me. So you go on to your presumptuous ways and you build up this, quote, image of God theme. But you are the recipient of everyone's awe, everyone's fascination. You become Nimrod. You build a whole city in your honor. You build your world in your honor. Everyone worships you. Everyone admires you. Everyone wants to be you. Everyone wants to be you. Everyone needs to envy your life. Click. <laughs> Behold, therefore, I will bring strangers against you, the most terrible of the nations, and they shall draw their swords against the beauty of your wisdom and defile your splendor. It's going to sound strange. What I'm about to say is thank God for you. For your sake, to help you, to disenchant you. Why is all this happening to me now just when I was rolling, just when I was getting everything I ever wanted in life? Why are these terrible things? Who are these people? What are these random things coming out of the woodwork tearing me down from my beautiful, self-enchanted, perfume atmosphere glory? Dispelling me of my being enthralled with my own glorious splendor and fame where I have controlled everyone around me and spin everything according to my will. Why is this no longer working? And defile your what? Whose splendor? Your splendor. We will touch on that in the Ezekiel 16 part of this study. Whose splendor? That's the problem. It's your splendor. People fascinated with your splendor of your wisdom. And how beautiful that you spin the narratives in your emphasis, wisdom, and your, excuse me, splendor. They've defiled it. Good. Good, it was already defiled in the eyes of God. Shall throw you down into the pit and you shall die the death of the slain in the midst of the seas. Wow. You better hope God does this before it ends up being the big giant collective judgment. God had better do a early pre-advent micro version of it to bring us down from our self-exaltation. In this very, very well ornate and decorated little throne that we've made up, in which we sit on, and everything is our little circle of sycophants that we've surrounded ourselves with, we better be careful that we're not setting ourselves up and fattened ourselves for our own slaughter. Will you still say before him who slays you, I am a God? Are you going to, are you that attached to your narrative? Even in the face of impending doom and even the sense that you might feel or that we might feel in this message, are we going to steal our heart? Are we going to galvanize and crystallize and harden our heart? Against this, we, we, we have exhibit a Pharaoh. We have the ark one to do this, Lucifer. Judas did it, the foot wash. You're going to really hold on to this thing? You're going to really go out and do this? Be careful that your narrative doesn't give you a courage that even is shocking to yourself that when God literally holds the flaming sword over your head and you finally say, I don't care, kill me, I'm still doing it. You need to be, we need to be pulled back from the precipice of that. Consider this a warning. But you shall be a man. You're not a big shot. You're not a God. As shocking as that might be to us. We are not gods.
and not a God. In the hand of him who slays you, God judges. And we are truly accountable to him for such delusional presumption. You shall die the death of the uncircumcised by the hand of aliens, for I have spoken, says the Lord God. Verse 11, moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of In other words, why does God make people weep for the wicked? This is important, and I'm going to say this in a way that is strange. When the women were weeping for Christ, he says, weep for yourselves. Lamentation. In other words, when you are weeping, it's weeping for those who don't weep for themselves. I'm not talking about people that weep for themselves in their self-pity. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about that in their arrogance. I'm not talking about the bitter weeping of Esau or even the better, bitter weeping of Peter before he was converted. That was not his conversion. His conversion was Christ sitting down and going through a very difficult examination of his soul on the beachhead after a morning of fishing. Then where he has to face himself. You see, there are those that are just predatorial in their mind where they don't care. And sometimes you don't wake up. You've seen in court cases where there are people that they're standing there and they've killed somebody and they don't really care until there is a victim impact statement. Not even yelling and screaming at them, but literally forgiving them. Weeping for them, pitying them, and all of a sudden you see the softening of the heart of that killer. Sometimes we don't know to weep for ourselves. Sometimes we are too hard-headed and too caught up in our own head. And then we have to see the weeping, the consequences, the pain, the destruction, the flotsam and jetsam of the shipwreck in which all of the evidence of destruction is all around us and all the loss of other people, lives ruined. I've seen I've seen a relationship where narcissists will just run through somebody's life and they don't wake up until they actually see that they've ruined that person. And all of a sudden, their compassion kicks in too little too late. Be careful that that's not you. You've destroyed your children. You've destroyed your relationships. And you don't wake up until what? Lamentations. Thus says the Lord God, you were seal, the seal of perfection. You've already, that's the problem. When you see the light, be careful that you don't go to war with that light. That you don't steal your heart and galvanize and harden yourself against this light that God has shown you that should have softened you, right? Goodness of God should have caused your repentance, not for you to despise the goodness of God. Full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Remember, this is the splendor you're going to see later on that God now does the same thing for his people and then she becomes a harlot. Be careful. You were in Eden, the garden of God. You saw everything perfect and beautiful, a perfect environment, a perfect climate set up delicately, perfectly, and then you went and did it again. Lucifer showed himself. He didn't just do it in heaven. He came down to a 2.0 of a perfect environment, and he came with his poison again, just like somebody who never gets it. They go out and look for brand new situations that's all clean, new, and innocent, and then they spread their poison again and again and again, and they never learn. Give them a new perfect environment with a new perfect situation, and they will bring it down to the ruins that they brought everything. I just need another break. No, no, no. Lucifer doesn't need another perfect situation to ruin. Every precious stone was your covering. 
You were beautiful. I gave you great wisdom, great light, great insight. The more that God breaks off to you, and the more you have grown comfortable in the kind of perversion of giving yourself permission to kind of get glory out of it, we're not seeing the foul, wretched stain and warp and bend and twist to the fabric of your own soul. The sardis, the topaz, the diamond, beryl, onyx, jasper, all the variety, all the varied kind of mediums and with this where this light is going to shine through in all of its spectrums. I gave you this large, large ability to apply great spectrum to the light that is me, says God. Sapphire, turquoise, emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. The way that you communicate, the way you make the sounds, the expressions, the capacity, God gave Lucifer great spectrum from nuance to dramatics and the various forms and colors and textures and tapestries to be an amazing teller of God's glory, an amazing presenter of God's glory. But something happened in the narratives of his heart where he gave himself permission to make it about him, even though it wasn't perceivable to the angels. And in fact, that was the hardest congregation to tell and to convince that Lucifer was twisting this to be God. Angels were like, no, no, no. He's just a great storyteller. I really enjoy his sermons. He is just an amazing storyteller, and I just love his sermons. But weirdly, yeah, I only have a desire to hear him because I want his view. And I'm kind of grown and chanted with him in some weird way. He is more interesting to me than the God that I meet. When I meet God, God seems flavorless like an unsalted egg white. When I meet Lucifer, all of a sudden it's spicy. It's delicious. It's like meat that is strangled with adrenochrome and adrenaline running through it and then highly seasoned, marinated in a flesh pot. (laughs) Satan is brisket. And all of a sudden, all that flavoring was really about Lucifer. Well, David, I'm sure glad that there are not people out there that do that that speak from the pulpit. I'm sure glad we're not in danger of that. All right, let me keep reading. Verse 14 says, you are the anointed cherub who covers, right? Just like the sons of Noah. Your duty is to cover these very exposed parts of God. Until God tells you to reveal them in such a way. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. I gave you incredible access to God's glory and my throne, my government, and the inner workings of things. And nothing is more dangerous, Judas. Nothing's more dangerous than having an immense amount of insight and then deciding to betray it for the purpose of of your thirsty, internal, vacuous, insatiable, black hole of this apparent desire and need, apparent need to be the object of glory and admiration. You are perfect in your ways from the day you were created till iniquity was found in you. The word perfect is the idea innocent. You were clean of that. I didn't give you a bend to do that. But I gave you the free will to choose, and the choosing could have been, I would not violate God. The goodness I saw in God, I believe in his instructions to me, that he can show me something, but for me not to reveal them. Every sinner that Christ healed said, don't go and tell anybody, and they went and told, and Christ knew. 
We absolutely have no patience, no delay gratification. And even though God used it and he had to throttle this process, even when he was here on earth, even in good things, but we have no sense of delayed gratification. When God says, I'm going to show you something, but you got to hold on to it. And then we go and gossip it away, be it good or how about bad, even worse. What if God commands you where God knows your sins, knows your dark story? knows your failings, knows your shame points. God doesn't go around telling everybody. God holds that information, even in wicked. I'm talking about just even the goodness of God. That is also something where God throttles it out. <clears throat> because he knows the heart of men and the exploitation factor. They're not ready for certain things. But even look at how that's played out amongst gossip in the church. That if you really want to have the restraining power of God in your life and the, quote, patience or the ability to remain, and God says you need to do a restoration process with someone before you ever even think of exposing, it's better to cover a multitude of sins and then to have something revealed to you as a leader, as an elder, as a pastor, as a whoever, as a friend, as a brother and sister in Christ. And that information is not for you to become clean in the eyes of other people because now you're comparing yourselves to one another in some cannibal state. As if you're in New Guinea with a bone in your nose, jumping up and down with a spear. And this is, sorry, New Guinea. I'm not, I know that New Guinea, the gospel is going crazy, beautiful out there. This is just in the far distant past. I could talk about also the Caribbean islands. The word Carib, Caribbean means what? Cannibal. Some of the most godliest people in the world are in the Caribbean, by the way. But they were ex-cannibals. And God knows, right? If you saw any of my series that we just did on the communion service parts one and two of the David Leon channel, I mean, this is our nature. We're just natural born, blood slurping, flesh tearing cannibals. We love it warm and we love it fresh. And this is what we do with gossip. And this is kind of our nature. Till iniquity is found in us. We cannot sit on that information. We have to leak it out, and then we have to make ourselves the hero. What about God reveals something about somebody to what is going on with them, and then you go and minister to it, and nobody ever finds out about it, and they are restored, and you're not even known as the hero that restored them? Would you be okay with that arrangement? Not even a little bit of acknowledgement, not even a widow, widow, tiny little widow bit of it. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within and you sinned. The word violence in Hebrew, we just think of it as like an assault, like someone beating up on somebody. The word violence in Hebrew is the word to take something from somebody that was their portion, their lot. God gave that to them. In other words, you had Ahab and Jezebel take with violence Naboth's um, uh, uh, vineyard. No, God, and he, his defense was God gave it. That was God's inheritance for our family. So to take somebody where God has appointed something to somebody or appointed somebody to do something and that you do the switcheroo. No, no, it's me. It's got to be me. If this person was called to serve God in this way, you say, no, 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 no. It's for me. It's mine. It's mine. No, I want it. You sit down. It's me. It's me. It's my glory. That's called violence, believe it or not. If God has portioned something for somebody else or he has called someone and you saw that God is training them or, or building them up to do that and you want to jump to the front of the line and then they are disqualified in some kind of human way, even in the church, even in the church, even in the church, and you become jealous, and you stand in the way. There are many people, and I'm going to say this, and this is with absolute truth, and heaven will record it, and heaven will bear testimony of it, and will stand through eternity, what I'm about to say. There are many people, in fact, most people, that should be serving tables that are in leadership position. And there are many people that are serving tables that um, 
how am I putting this? That should be in leadership position. And the people that should be serving tables, but are in leadership position, are super, super protective of that position. They don't want those that were genuinely called to be in that position. In fact, they kind of weirdly get off on and lust after the fact that they can hold that person down to keep them serving tables. Like there's a certain prevailing spirit in which they kind of celebrate their own heart that they can hold somebody down that God has portioned to really be in their position, that they should not be in a pastoral role. They should not be in a teaching role. They should be sitting down at the pew and maybe doing some light teaching, but really not being at the front of the line because they have an ego problem. And I know for a fact that that's a part of how wicked this generation is, is that this is absolutely the majority of what's going on. That's why you see and you're wondering, well, why are these people, if God hasn't appointed them to be pastor, but it sure seems weird. Or if God hasn't appointed them into a leadership position, it sure, sure seems weird because I've met people that seem just so much more qualified. Guess what? A lot of times they actually are. But this is the state in which we're in at the end of days. If it seems topsy-turvy, if it seems backwards, if it seems like the whole thing is inverted, you're in the last days. Enough of that. And you sinned with this, quote, violence. Therefore, I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub. We know who he's talking about. And he's talking about the future fate of Lucifer. Right now, it's apparent that he reigns. It's apparent that everything's upside down. That's what it looks like. The wicked seem to be doing wonderfully. The evil leaders, the evil princes of this world, they seem to have all the power and all the authority and all the narrative seems to go with them. Welcome to this to the chapter in which we're in. And don't think it's not because that the church has not done their part in sinning. I don't mean just in moral ways, but in jumping on these bandwagons, all these trends, all these conventional ways of thinking, all this joining up with the world and not thinking there's going to be any consequences to it, all this compromise, all of this not wanting to bear reproach or be offensive. And so what do we do? We find everything we can to be in harmony with this world, in harmony with Babylon, in harmony with Rome, and then there is no consequences. This is it. America has lost its glory. We know it's no longer a true refuge for Protestantism and liberty. We have now joined the hands to medievalism. Medievalism is now absolutely, we're an image of medievalism. The lamb-like beast is now becoming an image to medievalism. If you don't see it, I'm sorry, but it's true. We'll be doing a series on that pretty soon. Keep it in prayer. From the midst of the fiery stones, boy, be careful of our proximity to to God, and when he flashes these true insights into himself, that we have got to watch out for our heart. The heart narrative is the scariest, most dangerous place in the universe. Verse 17 says, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. Your heart, your heart, your heart, your heart, your heart. Internal processes. What, what is that core cardio place in which everything circulates around and all the dynamism is started off by that initial like prime mover is your heart. The heart is the prime mover. When I used to do anti-submarine warfare, you have a prime mover and then you have the shaft and the gear system and then you have the gears and the ratio of gears and you, you know, have propellers and everything else are running off the prime mover. The heart is the prime mover. Everything that is spun and done and said and thought and processed and how we move about this life and the relationships we have and our ambitions and the jobs we have and the people we hang out with and what we say when we hang out with them are really the result of the prime mover of the heart. We have core motives and God says, I don't look upon the outside. I'm not looking at all the wheels than wheels that you have spinning around you that are used as a form of protection and uh, camouflage and a fortress and a cocoon 
and an incubator and a palace. You can't hide. I see you. I see you, the Wizard of Oz. The prime mover is the heart. And it's a core narrative that we even at some point we want to put on automatic pilot. As soon as the little wickedness is taken over, we like to go into this subconscious mode. And then we're not accountable. I know the game. Satan has played that game. We play that game. We set on ourselves on a course. We do it deliberately. Then we hit autopilot. And then we play oblivion games. I want someone to get a hold of this. This is probably one of the most core parts of the study right now is what I'm saying. We do our wicked little miserly planning and we set all the dials and then we hit autopilot and then we walk off and play innocent. We walk off and we play, well, I'm not accountable because I'm kind of oblivious right now, but you weren't when you were setting everything in dial tone. When you were going and setting all the calibrated kind of things and you set everything and then it's locked in and you hit autopilot and everything is now on automation and then you go off and you play innocent, God's going to take you back to that. You playing cognitive dissonant games in which it is like seven layers from accountability. What? God knows all the work you did to set the dials to your life. And then you're reaping the benefits and you want to play this false innocence. Why am I able to actually even communicate this now? You tell me of all the books that are written about this because, because God is sending the Holy Spirit to now give words to unspeakable things. Things that we thought were hidden in the dark, things that we thought would be veiled, things that we thought were so complex that there was not narratives out there to put labels on it. Guess what? Time's up. God's giving words to his messengers, warning that that system of cognitive dissonance in which we could set up the entire mechanisms and the entire system and do it deliberately, set on an autopilot, and then pretend oblivion as we operate from some conscious subconsciousness, which we are only doing minor maintenance to it as we go along, but we play oblivion. Guess what? Time's up. There's words for it now. God knows the heart. You could run, but you cannot hide from God. You're, you've corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. Whose splendor? Remember, we're going to get into Ezekiel 16. God cloaked us with his splendor. Now we've twisted it to make it our splendor, to worship our glorious image, the beauty of our wisdom. We've now taken credit for it. What will God do with that? Where does the glory of man need to go? I cast you to the ground. Where does the glory of this spirit, this mentality, says from there I will take you down. This is a place that we need to come down from, not ascend to, not aspire to. Should not be our ambition. We should admire people that are doing this, thinking that they're never going to be touched or it's worth it. I'll cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings that they might gaze at you. You see this in Revelation 19, I mean, uh, 18 and 17. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities. By the iniquity of your trading, that little trafficking and play and interplay in which you engage in in this life and you get all the benefits from it. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. What is he saying? I started the fire from inside. In other words, it's a car fire, but it didn't start from the outside, it started from the engine. I will set you on fire in the lake of fire, but the fire isn't from the outside in. It starts from the inside out. It's starting with your heart. I will now set the fire of judgment off inside of you, and it will start from your heart and will radiate out to every part of you and your life, your words, your everything, your actions. It starts off with your thoughts. It starts off with your intent. 
It starts off with your vain imagination. It starts off with your internal narratives and every vain word. It starts off in that area of the internal processes. And then it goes into your feelings and your emotions and your words and your actions and your influences and how that was deposited in other people and how they spun other wheels, other gear systems, other connected people. And now it's become a connected cog and gear system in which your influence started here inside of your head and it went out. And we're going to have to track that all the way down to the last ripple that touched the shore. But he says, I brought the fire from your midst. It devoured you. I turned you into ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. Everything that you thought was a hidden process was a pathetic, sad seeking of trying to fill a vacuous hole that was unnecessary. Turn to God. You don't need to be worshipped. It's a vain. It's a fool's journey. It's a. It's a. It's it's a foolish pursuit. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror, and you shall be no more forever. You shall be as ashes below the feet. You will be destroyed. You don't have perpetual eternal life. At some point, it ends, and it became nothing because you were serving nothing. All right, this is kind of how we're going to, uh, this is kind of a, I'm going to share a little bit here, and then we're going to finish off with um, Ezekiel 16. Basically, all I'm going to really do is, why is this not scrolling? Is we need to be careful because primarily it was God's people that God was warning. First Corinthians 10 is telling you, all were baptized into the cloud and into Moses. All ate of the same spiritual food. All drank the same spiritual drink. But what happened? Most were not pleasing to God. Most were destroyed in the wilderness. Most died. Most perished. Why? They saw the front full view of the glory of God. And then they allowed that heart issue to take over. And those little wheels to spin in their head. And it ruined them. It destroyed them out in the wilderness. And God keeps saying, how many times do you need to see that story play out where you yourself are not taking heed to this? Nobody is more guilty of destroying themselves than God. See, the ignorance of Nineveh helped ignorance because once they had the screeching loud cry of the glory of God coming from the belly of the whale, Jonah, who pops out knowing the, the vanity of man, the glory of man, which is nothing, and he cried out to the temple of God above, and he knew that righteousness came from above in Christ and his mediation. And he went out and he spoke this to this war nation in which the, all the northern territories were terrified. All of the 10 tribes of Israel that were north were in horror of these people. They all repented down to the squirrels in the trees. It's interesting how we, in some bizarre presumption, I've comforted ourselves that this is not dangerous what we're doing. And what's interesting is I'm not going to go into all these verses in 1 Samuel 5. I want you guys to look at it. And in Judges 16, which is this whole picture of capturing the ark. When Phinehas and Hopney decided to use God's glory in a presumptuous way to really avoid the consequences for their wicked, twisted, Luciferian way of ministering as covering cherubs as these two sons of Aaron types, as Nadab and Abihu 2.0, Eli's sons. You see, they wanted to thwart the consequences for doing that. God allowed the Philistines to come in and to be as a rod of chastisement. It happened again where God sent it Babylon later on. Remember Shiloh. This was a Shiloh event. Don't fight. God's saying, bear the consequences for you doing this. Don't use my glory as a means to cover the consequences for you being a little Lucifer. 
And they did that. Then they captured the Ark. And then guess what happens? They put him in the Temple of Dagon. And then Dagon falls. And then the Philistines, it says that they are filled with rats and with tumors. And then they realize that this is judging us. Having the glory of God is a fearful and terrible thing. And they wanted to get rid of the glory of God because trying to capture God and use him as a device of manipulation and to subject God to Dagon, all we got to do is look no further than that's what we do. We're Dagon. We're the fish God. (laughs) And we're trying to make God subject to us and to serve our dark underworld needs. And then God, when he plagues our life, Rats, the idea of a rat is a tumor. It's like it's something that's filling the body and eating and taking everything over. Like if you're to look at cancer, you would call them a a city filled with rats, with tumors, eating everything up and causing poison and spreading poison everywhere. And God says, well, when you do that to my glory, it's a cancer. And so they got rid of the ark and said, we cannot bear such a glory. Dagon even bowed down to that. But what about our hearts? Why don't we bow down? Why don't we realize the danger of this? And I bring this up because what's interesting is the same thing with Samuel. Guess who their God was in Judges 16? It says, the now the lords of the Philistines gathered together to offer a sacrifice to Dagon, their God, and they rejoiced when they captured Samson. It's interesting how we think that we could somehow possess and control God because of the whole control freak mentality that we have. And we're moving right into what happens when Ezekiel 16, when God saw us in our dying in our blood and our guilt and our shame. And we're put in the most precarious of situations. We cried out, God help me. God save me. Then when he comes by and he restores our life and then he shows us his glory and he covers us with our splen- with his splendor. And then we go out and sell it like a bunch of prostitutes thinking that there is no real consequence for that. Nobody's in greater danger than that. That's the most dangerous position you can take. That presumption is a killer. That's Lucifer-y in 100%. And don't think that God's people are not capable of it. I am truly at this point very, very exhausted and tired of Christians telling me they can't lose their salvation. This is what the Luciferian mind is. Yes, you can. Don't you say that? Don't you remember Shiloh? Don't you remember Lucifer? He was perfect. He was the seal of perfection. There was no wicked way in him. This presumption is the murder weapon, the suicide device. For the people of God, presumption that I could take the glory of God and I could make it serve my means. And this is what happened here back again in this Dagon worship. What is Dagon? It's the fish God. It is the God of the underworld. It's our soul. God is the fisher of men. He's trying to take something that lives and moves and operates in the darkest places of the obscure seas and waters of our consciousness This is the picture, the ancient picture of fish operating under the surface. And these waters represent our, quote, subconsciousness and the currents and the movement and all of this kind of activity that is there. And he brings it to the surface. And it feels like it's dying. (laughs) So when God is fisher of men, he takes the very internal processes that are moving very comfortably and moving with the currents and feeding and doing whatever else. And he takes it to the surface and you feel like you're dying. You feel like you're dying when God catches you. And now Peter gets a catch and he pulls all the fish and they're all twisted and freaking out. And he says, hey, Peter, let's have a conversation about some fish. I'm a fisher of men. I need to pull you out of your little subconscious nonsense. And we need to bring you to the surface while you're flopping around. So let me ask you some questions. While you're flopping around, I've got something to ask you. Three times. Here, by the way, I'm serving fish for for breakfast. We need to deal with the nonsense of your subconscious thinking that you're better than everyone else. If 
fact, I'm going to go through a little bit of this. First Samuel 5, 1 through 4, and the Philistines took the God, the Ark of the God, brought it from Ebenezer to Ashad. Ebenezer means what? God helps you. So God's helping you, and then you decide to capture God because God seems to be weak. He's just there to use. He's your, he's your therapist. And he's the buddy that you get to just go to whenever you're hurting. But then when you're done with him, you use it. It's like so much toilet paper. Then you go off with your friends and you do your thing, right? God's just something to use. When the Philistines took the Ark of God, they brought it to the house of Dagon, the fish god, the god of the underworld, the subconscious. And set it by Dagon. And when the people of Ashad arose in the morning, there was Dagon fallen on his face to the earth before the Ark of the Lord. Yeah. Be careful of your proximity to the Shekinah glory, to the light of God that exposes your subconscious. Bow down and worship. At least Dagon had the sense to do that. They took Dagon and set it in its place again. And they rose early the next morning. There was Dagon falling on his face before the Ark of the Lord. Man, Dagon had more sense than God's people. That's the moral of the story. The head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands were broken off the threshold and only Dagon's torso was left of it. Wow, that's a powerful realization. Your head and your hands. You know, your head, your hands, your forehead, your right hand. Be careful what you think and be careful what you do. Be careful that God is not tracking you from inside out. And when the men of Ashad, Ashdod, excuse me, saw how it was, they said, the ark of the God of Israel must not remain with us for his hand is harsh towards us and Dagon, our God. Yeah. Wow. God is a revealer of this God that rules in the undetected underworld of the deep currents of our soul. And we don't want them exposed, do we? We want to play these little games where we set the dials and then we let them go on autoplay and then we play Oblivion and then we're on our little seas and our little boat. Oh my, this is also working out for me, the laws of attraction. Judges 16, the lords uh, of the Philistines gathered together to offer great sacrifice to Dagon, their God, rejoice. They said, our God has delivered into our hands Samson, our enemy. Don't you remember that Christ is, is a Nazarite? Samson, who looked like this kind of one who's going to marry a pagan wife, that God told him to marry the pagan wife, that Samson was a picture of Christ marrying us. And when the people saw him, they praised their God, the subconscious game-playing, working through the narcissistic subconscious God, and they said, our God has delivered into our hands, our, uh, uh, delivered into our hands, our very enemy. Ah, the narc is winning. The destroyer of our land and the one who multiplied our dead. Yeah, of course. Don't we hate God for ruining everything? So it happened that when their hearts were merry, they said, call for Samson that he may perform for us. And that's. When we think we capture God and his glory, God is nothing but a performing clown to us. They shaved off his head. What the Philistines, what the uncircumcised mind does is it takes the glory of God, which is pictured here as Samson. And they shave his head. They want to remove his strength. They want to bind him. And then they want a circus performance from him exactly as what Herod did at the trial of Christ, perform tricks for me. You with the long hair, clown boy, bow down and acknowledge my authority and my power and I'll set you free. This is the Lucifer game. This is what's in the heart. This is the inner process of Dagon, the subconscious and the underworld of our soul. This is what's being revealed in these stories. And Dagon will fall. And in fact, if you want to be converted, if you want to be as the 3,000 on the day of Pentecost, if you want to realize 
that we are the God-killing machine, the crucifiers of Christ, those that are the deiciders, God-killers. Those that are of the great rebellion of those who made the golden calf. 3,000 killed in a day. 3,000 converted at Pentecost. Perform for us, Nazarite. Do a little trick. Do your thing, ATM God. And so they call for Samson from the prison, and he performed for them, and they stationed him between the pillars. And Samson said to the lad who held him by the hand, let me feel the pillars which support the temple. Destroy this temple, and in three days I'll raise it up again. Now the temple was full of men and women, and the lords of the Philistines were there about 3,000 men and women. Ah. All these parables, all not just parables, all of these events are parabolic to us. If you want to be converted, if you want to be born again, we must see ourselves as Christ killers, holding Christ as prisoner, making him our clown. Our performing seal. Come on, Jesus. Chop, chop. We have you in our little prison. You're bound. This is this is open theism. This is we control you. It's in many doctrines. This is what transubstantiation believes. The priests control Christ and turns him into bread. Come on, circus clown. And we have our version of doing this. Come on, circus clown. Perform for me. For my glory. For my glory. Do your trick again. One little fascinating thing before we get into the Ezekiel 16, and we'll wrap it up with that. It just says, <clears throat> Matthew 2, verse 22 and 23. But when we heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judah instead of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. And being warned by God in a dream, this is Joseph, and he turned aside into the region of Galilee. Why Galilee? We're going to see here in a sec. And he came and dwelt in the city called Nazareth. Interesting. That it might be fulfilled, which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. Where in the scripture is the Messiah called the Nazarene? Every Jew knew that Samson was a Christ figure. He became a fool for God. Christ sacrificing himself, making himself for poor that we could be rich, making himself a bondservant when he was in a place of authority, making himself accessible to Satan just so he could bring his whole little palace down. Wow. God's foolishness is greater and wiser than Satan's wisdom. God becomes a fool, better look out. He might be taking down your whole kingdom. Let's see if this at all makes any sense. Isaiah prophesy about the government of God and him who is the rightful heir and him who rules with a rod of iron says, Isaiah chapter nine, verses one and two, nevertheless, the gloom will not be upon her who is distressed as when at first, he highly esteemed the land of Zebulun, the land of Naphtali. Why? You'll see. Afterward, more heavily oppressed by her by way of sea beyond the Jordan in the Galilee of the Gentiles, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Who is light unto the Gentiles? Who is this Samson who dwelt in Galilee in the place of where the Philistines were? Who lost? but one in the end. Be careful you don't defeat God. Be careful you don't house him in your little prison cell and think that he is tied and bound. Be careful. 
Be careful, Dagon worshiper. Be careful, worshiper of your internal dynamic subconscious underworld fish kingdom. You rule as Neptune or as Aquaman. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them a light has shined. Be careful what you do with that light. Be careful. Because the government, the next verse is, I didn't get into it, the government is upon his shoulders. His name shall be called Wonderful. Him who is the rightful heir is Christ. Be careful what you do with him. Be careful what you do with the Son of God and the Son of Man. Be careful what you do when God makes himself of no reputation. Be careful what you do when he is a root from a dry ground in which there is no beauty and there is no comeliness that we should divide desire him. Be careful what you do when he has presented himself in great humility. Be careful when he comes in meek and mild and lowly of heart. Be careful. Be careful what you do to him when it seems apparent he has no power. Be careful. especially to God's people, when they get to see these more vulnerable qualities about God, be careful. The further you are from God, the Gentile nations, all they saw was the power of God to destroy Egypt, to destroy great enemies. The closer you come, ask Nadab and Abihu, ask Eli's sons, Ask anyone who has seen the glory of God. Ask Lucifer himself. The closer you come, the more you see of the intricate qualities about God. Be careful of what happens in that coconut of ours. And the permission we give ourselves to make God our circus performance clown because he's gentle and tender and mild and caring. And he is connected to the feelings of our infirmities and he cares and he's anxious over us and he cares for us. Be careful what we look in our eye and how we look upon God as a burden bearer, that he is our new beast of burden. And we act as lords and kings over God. Be careful of that theology. Be careful of that narrative in your church. Be careful of that teaching. Be careful of that mindset. But more importantly, be careful of that spirit that doesn't even communicate it with words, but has that spirit to it. This is our last section of scripture, and we'll wrap it up. And it says, to us, to me, to God's people, the real warning, the super whore, the super prostitute, the super hooker, It's God's people. It's those that have had the closest and the most intimate interaction with these most amazing and tender and intricate qualities about God are the ones who harden more than anybody. Ezekiel 16, and we'll just kind of move through. We can't, it's super, it's a very long chapter. So we have to kind of move through some choice verses to kind of get the idea. And if you want homework assignment, just read Ezekiel 16. And that's talking about us. It's not just talking about, because even in God's people, you have those who have had more light than others. And you'll see in Ezekiel 16 that uh, Israel, the northern tribes, had a certain amount of light. But the southern tribe, Judah, with Benjamin, had the greatest light. They had Jerusalem. They had the temple. They had the priests. They became the super harlot. Hey, Israel was a bad enough harlot. She was a nasty hooker. But man, Judah, she took it to new levels. She wasn't even getting paid. She was paying everyone else. She was chasing everyone down, just like the church is now. You'll see that. The church is doing that now. We don't even get a payoff for all the harlotry we're doing now. And in fact, we're getting no payoff. In fact, we're losing. We're losing numbers. We're losing people. We're losing the presence of God. Lose, 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 but we still keep hooking. God help us. 
Ezekiel 16, verses 3 through 20, etc. I'll tell you the verses when we get to it. We're going to skip around. It says, and thus says the Lord God to who? Jerusalem, the beating heart, the mother of us all. The center where the God's glory resides. It says, your birth and your nativity are from the land of Canaan. And your father was an Amorite and your mother Hittite. You were naturally disqualified. You were born estranged from God. You are uh, truly corrupt from the womb. There is a natural stillborn death birth that you had. And when God shows you your nativity, just as the book of Job shows us, we are born stillborn. We are born out of season. There is no reason that we should have rightful inheritance to God. We were adopted by God. Adoption isn't about the Gentiles. God says humanity is the adoption process. That is the glory of God. He is an adopting father. As for your nativity, on the day that you were born, your navel cord was not cut. You had a natural sin nature, and your father is the devil. Nor were you washed uh, in water to cleanse you. You weren't pure. Your soul wasn't pure. You were not rubbed with salt, nor wrapped in swaddling clothes, nor I pitied you, nor any of these things for you, to do any of these things for you, to have compassion on you. But you were thrown into the open field when you yourself were loathed on the day that you were born. You think Satan loves you? You think the flesh loves you? You might think the world even loves you. But in reality, it's only how they can use you. It's only how Satan can use you. We tend to think that out there we're missing out on something, that Egypt loves us. Let's go ahead and let's form a golden calf and let's bring offerings. Let's go back to Egypt, say, sorry, I know you love me. It's like every toxic relationship. we got to go back to the abuser, right? We have to start forming like false memories of how wonderful it all was. Verse six says, and when I was, when I passed by you and I saw you struggling in your own blood, pass me not, O gentle Savior. Kumbaya, Lord. Don't move on. Son of David, please have mercy. Please have compassion. Don't move on. Don't be as the God moving through the universe. Pause and pay attention to me. And Christ showed when he had his healing ministry that this is the kind of God he is. And I said to you in your blood, live. Yes, I said to you in your blood, live. You're gurgling and dying and covered in blood. You're an aborted child. This is a picture of early abortion where they would throw this baby connected to the afterbirth, umbilical cord still attached. And they would throw the bloody screaming dinner bell of a child slathered in blood for all the wild animals and the wild dogs to eat. And the mother turns away and behind her is the gurgling, screeching screams of that baby until she is finally comforted by the silence. The jackals and the dogs and the wolves gobbled up her little baby. She could move on with her life now. Right. She could be with that man and have her career and not be bothered with the consequence of her choices. God said, whoa, 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 whoa. You are that baby. And you don't think I have compassion on you? Your mother may forsake you. Your father may forsake you. And leave you out in that field to be torn to shreds. In your helplessness. But I came to that baby and I said, live. This is you and me, guys. And whenever we see that God is showing us his compassion here, he's giving us front row view of his glory. Be careful what you do with a compassionate and tender God that has deep eternal sympathies. Be careful. A presumption. Because this woman wasn't. I made you thrive like a plant in the field and you grew you really matured you developed and i nurtured that right i matured you became very beautiful be careful it's going to start sound like lucifer pretty soon don't let us be lucifer 2.0 your breasts were formed your hair grew but you were naked and bare when i passed by you again 
I'm thinking, wait a minute, you need more than just me making sure you're safe and beautiful and mature and nurtured. You know what? Song of Solomon time. Actually, the woman I saved is going to be the woman I marry. And make her my wife, make her my bride, make her my companion, make her bone of my bone and flesh my flesh to bring her to the closest possible relationship that you could have. I'm going to make her. I'm Solomon, Shalom, I'm peace. I'm going to make her Shulamite. Shalom in Hebrew, in the feminine. We're going to become Echad. We're going to become one. I'm going to wrap her with the robes of my righteousness, and she's going to come into a total relationship with me in which everything that is mine is hers. She's going to be in the most ultimate, vulnerable, naked place in which I'm naked and she's naked and we're unashamed and we become echad, we become one. Indeed, your time was the time of love. Song of Solomon, right? Do not stir up nor awaken love until it pleases. This is the time. This is the awakening. This is the call to the gospel. This is bridegroom crying out to a bride who's in a wilderness coming to bring her nakedness to be covered by the bridegroom. This is the call that goes out in the last day as an eschatological call. In these last days, it's pictured right here. Be careful of our heart. There is either this woman who completely is hidden in that embrace of her husband, an alma, an almond, or the harlot that exploits this. Song of Solomon. It was a time of love. I spread my wing over you, the hem of my garment, the word for healing in my wings. I put you into my borders and covered your nakedness. You were naked like in the Garden of Eden, and I covered you with my lamb skin. I have sacrificed myself to cover you from your shame and from your place of being destitute. Yes, I swore an oath to you. I could swear by no one higher than myself that I will be the one who pays the dowry. I'm the Nazarite. Going over the ground in which you have failed, I myself will become the one to live out the life of righteousness that was needed for you and then impute my life, the walking out of life, obedience to a, to a God in which I have relinquished my position. That's what he did in Philippians 2. He relinquished his divine robes even though he's still divine, he's still God with the privilege. And then enter into the nakedness of humanity to be born of a woman, to be born under the law. And that's a Nazarite vow. The branch that was extended to us in which he has lived out the perfection that we need in which he had long hair and he was wearing a garment without a seam or a hem, which is a wedding garment. And then he took the path. He traveled the path and lived out the, the righteous life that a bride should have lived out to be worthy to be married to the king. So he left his role, entered into that role, lived out a life of perfection, and to live out a life of shame. A man was not to, quote, have long hair because it was a shame to him. So he carries out the life of living out the bridal life, the dowry price, the righteous life that was expected upon those who made covenant with God and promising a vow. Well, that's what the Nazarite was doing. So that's why he didn't drink of the cup that's why he didn't ha drink of the, the wine in that way. And this is why the Nazarite lived out this extreme vow. That's why Samson was going to marry a Philistine. He was going to be the righteousness for her. Much to study on this. And I swore to an oath and entered into a covenant with you, and you became Song of Solomon style mine. You are mine. And then she comforts herself in that his desire is for her, that she is possessed of him. She possesses him, but primarily and fundamentally and the most gloriously that he possesses her. He's laid a hold of her, just like Paul in Philippians chapter three says, well, he's laid a hold of me. I have not yet been perfected. I'm perfect in this, that I've laid a hold of Christ. He's laid a hold of the throne. He's laid a hold of that righteousness that I don't possess of myself, but Praise God that he's laid a hold of that, and he has a hold of me, and then he unites both heaven and earth. He laid down the dowry price. 
And then now what do I do? I'm just growing in maturity. But under the canopy of one who has paid the price and paid the dowry price, he's lived out of perfection and a righteousness I could not do for myself. And there is something humble. There is something beautiful. There is something splendorous and meek and mild and selfless about a God who would bear the shame of somebody else's debt and sin. And exposure to reproach and humility. The shambolic life that that is that Christ took upon himself as the Nazarite who showed it to be baptized in the muddy Jordan, putting on our debt, our plight, the expectations that we have from heaven and being meritorious for our stead. Please lay hold of that. This is the humility of God and the power of God and the comfort of God and the might of God. This is what God does. God is assuring us that I will be something for you that you cannot be for yourself. I am the mighty redeemer. I'm your Boaz. I'm your strength. I'm your kinsman redeemer. Verse 9 says, and then I washed you in water and I thoroughly washed off your blood and I anointed you. Why do we receive the Holy Spirit? Because we ourselves are Mashiach. We're Messiahs. We are rightful inheritors. No. It's through the work of imputation in which we are rendered as if we are everything that Christ is. The only one that has the spirit is Christ who showed up at the temple and he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. They all knew that who they, that was talking about. That is God. Only God rightfully is the fountain in which this, this picture of he's the anointed one. There's only one who is holy, only one who is righteous. There is a holy one of Israel in which God alone sees as deserving of being lavished with the fullness of the Spirit of God. The Godhead bodily. A walking temple. The three persons of the Godhead of all joined together into this communion fellowship in which they are all walking together and Christ is here for the manifest reality of that for us. We could see the entire, the Father, Son, the Holy Spirit are all right there in which we can see, hear the Father's voice. Jesus is speaking and the Spirit of God is with him. All three are literally in communion right there with Christ. We got to see that Shekinah. The reason we have the Holy Spirit is that God imputes the reality of Christ to us, imputation. Are we that in ourselves? No, we're dust to the ground. We're sinners. We are disqualified. We're thorns and thistles. We are cursed. We're carnal, sold under sin. That God would actually take earthen vessels, and that we have the spirit of God only tells you one thing. God renders us not according to who we are in ourselves, but he renders us according to who we are in the bridegroom, to the Nazarite. I clothed you in embroidered cloth and gave you sandals of badger skin. I, right? Feet shod with the gospel. Everything covered in badger skins out in the wilderness journey. I clothed you with fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you. Oh, no, this is starting to sound so much like Lucifer. This is a privilege we have. Be careful what you do with God's splendor, with ornaments, with bracelets on your wrists and a chain around your neck. And I put a jewel in your nose and earrings in your ears. And a beautiful crown on your head. Oh, no. Are you ready for us sounding like Lucifer throwing away all that glory to be a big, giant, sloppy, fat hooker? Thus you were adorned with gold and silver. Your clothing was of fine linen, silk, embroidered cloth. You ate the pastry of fine flour, honey, and oil. Sounds like manna. That's what manna was. You're exceedingly beautiful, exceeded to royalty. Your fame went out among the nations because of your beauty. It was perfect through my splendor. Oh, no, seal the perfection. Whose splendor? Uh-oh, be careful. Be careful that we don't twist it into our splendor, our wisdom, our beauty which I bestowed upon you. This is why justification by faith 
throws the glory of man to the dust of the ground because it's imputed. There is nothing innate or intrinsic with us. It was given to us based upon the quality of somebody else. Upon the reality of somebody else. Upon the value and the virtue of somebody else. Not you. God imputes to the ungodly. Before we start getting enchanted with how deserving we are or how amazingly fascinating we are, this whole false trip, this whole Maggio Geo stuff that's going on in the church and this worship of our own beauty and our own splendor, and there is barely anything going boo against it. Self-fascination is now the drug of the church. Are you guys still, uh, I know there's no comments. My fear is, is that I've stopped broadcasting. I'm just speaking into the wind. Please give me an idea if this study is still going, guys, because I don't know if it is. But you trusted in your own beauty. Here we go. Here we go. Lucifer 2.0, not with the heathen nations. God's people. Those that were personally God bent down in compassion and in tenderness came down to the lowest point to save us, to to exhibit to us the tender tendrils of his own soul to us. And now this is all being played out again. We're seeing the most vulnerable parts of God. Let me see, guys. I am concerned. Guys, I'm concerned that I'm just speaking to the air. This is not good. Okay, it's it's good. But you trusted in your own beauty and you played the harlot because of what? Of your fame. Now, this is Nimrod. This is this is again, we're fascinated by people recognizing us and us being in places where we're recognized what the marketplace at the head of the table looks like. It's strange how all of a sudden things change. When we get some notoriety, it happens in the church. It happens denominationally. It happens that, again, things change when you get a little bit of fame, a little bit of notoriety, where people now know your name, your self-fascination. And poured out your harlotry on who? On everyone passing who would have it. Just shameless. There is no real, like, I think we think we're discreet and demure. No, we pretty much anyone that'll listen. <laughs> we just don't blush anymore. We just don't blush. We're like the the without blush, we don't blush. You know, at least the Song of Solomon, she had pomegranate cheeks and she blessed. At least she knew her shame. I have so many people in my mind right now, but I don't forget about those people. Just the few of us that are listening, please just let's apply this to ourselves. Let's not. Now that we have a little bit of notoriety, recognition, and people think that we're amazing or cool or interesting or something like that. Don't enter into the no shame world. How dangerous. You took some of your garments and adorned multicolored and adorned multicolored high places for yourself and played the harlot upon them. This is the whole Joseph multicolored jacket kind of a picture. This was Tamar. This is like, I'm a beautiful virgin bride and I'm so like, untouchable and i i am in a privileged position with god in other words i'm reflecting all the bejeweled fiery stones on this mountain look i'm a display of this glory be careful when you are a display of god's glory that you watch that mind you watch that self awareness that turns into an ego that turns into a drinking from that fountain that turns into something that is your now, it's your new trip. 
it's your new way of being. You really love being the multicolored garment in which God's full spectrum is being shown. And then now you see yourself as the big, beautiful, decorated thing that needs to drink from that glory yourself. And you see yourself as some kind of a multicolored peacock. And how fascinating. You want everyone to be so fascinated with you. Such things should not happen or be. This is, Paul says this too in his own ways. This should not be. This thing that's happening amongst God's people and in the body of Christ should not be. This shouldn't be. All through Ezekiel, God says, this should not be. This is the abomination that will cause your desolation. Don't go down this pathway. Don't let your mind be set in this course. This is the most precarious, the most perilous, the most dangerous course is to be this close to the glory of God, to receive so much from God, and then you've decided to take this path. Verse 17 says, you have also taken your beautiful jewelry from my gold, God's glory, and my silver, his redemption, money of redemption, silver, which I have given you and made for yourself images, male images, and played the harlot with them. The level of, and I'm going to be very delicate in my words here, the level of self-pleasuring that you get from this is so detestable to God, so hateful to God, that he must turn away from it and call it the abomination that will cause your desolation. You have so pleasured yourself with this. You have carried yourself to levels of ecstasy with this, that God himself says that it is absolutely, your house is left unto you desolate. Become an object of destruction. It is a house of demons, a house of serpents. In other words, tie my hands to the pillars that I may bring this whole house down. It's become a, a den of thieves. A house of iniquity. You have taken my home and my glory and my beauty and my splendor, and you turned it into an object of self-pleasure. Verse 18, you took your embroidered garments, covered them. You set my oil and my incense before who? You're trying to get love and appreciation and value through people that hate me before them. People that despise and use God before them. People that are in rebellion against God. Yeah, even in the church. There are people that are angry at God, that resent God, that are in argument with God in the church. And yet you're chasing after them. You're trying to appease them. You're trying to make them fall in love with you. And you're using my name and my glory and my resources to do that. How are you not a harlot? Also, my food, which I gave you, the word of God, the bread of life. The pastry, a fine flour, the sweet, the beautiful, the intricate, the intimate things about God. You're using it to draw in people that hate God. Not that they may be changed but that you may be validated, you may be admired, you may be loved. You're so love hungry that you're using these qualities about God as hooks and, and fish bait and traps for your hungry soul. And God's not supposed to read the truth about this and not know. And honey, which I fed you, glory. And you set before them as sweet incense, and so it was. And the sweet incense is your ardor, your love, what burns, what is like your essence. That's what incense is, is essence, essential oil. It's it's something that is like condensed. It's it's what is really burning. It's it's your true desire and love. You gave them your best, says the Lord God. Verse 20 says, moreover, you took your sons and your daughters whom you bore to me, these you sacrifice to them to be devoured. 
You brought the youth into this. You ruined your children over this. You've allowed the youth to be drawn into this. You've handed them over to this. You use them for this process. Oh, church of God. Oh, church of Christ. Oh, remnant church. Oh, beautiful, beautiful virgin bride. What are you doing? Were your acts of harlotry a small thing, a little thing, negligible thing, an oopsie doopsie? Oh, my bad. Why have we minimized it? Every single horror and nightmare is based upon these little things. It was a small thing. Remember Lot's wife? She looked back. It was, it was a small thing. Can we go to Zohar? It's a small thing. Can I just have this small thing? Is it a small thing? It is a small thing to us, but to God, it's not a small thing. Is covetousness a small thing? Is secret meanderings and ponderings and marinating and, and cherishing gullum mine? Mine, precious mine. Is that a small thing? The golem. Verse 22, and in all your abominations and acts of harlotry, you did not remember the days of your youth when you were naked and bare and struggling in your own blood. You totally forgot your situation and you completely presumed upon God and all the promises you made, all of the realization you had, all the humility, you had second thoughts. And this is what I've been talking about from the beginning of this study. And your walk away thoughts. You quickly forgot what you saw when you were looking in the mirror that James is talking about. You see, your comeback thoughts. Your 2.0 thoughts. It's not the astonishing moment of humility that God is counting. He understands what first blush is going to produce and how blown away you are when these revelations hit you, including the study. It's what happens when you leave. It's the thoughts that come into your head that give you permission to go against everything that you now see up close. You forgot. That's why the Sabbath says, remember. That's why in the communion service, he says, this is so you remember. The thief on the cross is remember. You forgot. Verse 23 says, then it was so, and after all of your wickedness, woe, woe to you. And this is what Christ was crying to the Pharisees in the woes. You forgot. And you presumed. And you thought more than you were. And you thought that your position was immutable. It was an immovable position. That once you secured your position that you were locked in, but you forgot about Shiloh. It's not permanent. You cannot monopolize a position with God and think that it's impeachable. That you're so precious that you are inexpendable. Woe to you for such sin of presumption, says the Lord. Verse 24 says the Lord God. That you also built for yourself. For who? Yourself. What do we do in this life but build shrines for ourselves? Oh, they all think I'm great. When they think of me, they are just absolutely thinking, all we do is build shrines for ourselves and made a high pit place for yourself in every street. It's like we're on a putrid pursuit of vain glory in which we just want to be loved and spoke about and remembered and thought about by everyone. We just want everyone to just speak so highly of all of us. And for them to promote our name in some kind of vainglory of strange, worldly fame. It doesn't have to be like fame in the sense of TV fame. 
It's just how we just want everyone to admire, everyone to just speak highly of us. We are endlessly building a living resume, and we just want to hear the echoes of how beautiful everyone thinks we are, how well we speak, how amazing we are. And we're just really cheap. God says this is a very cheap, cheap thing. Every street, every high place. Verse 25 says, you built your high places at the head of every road, every place you have an opportunity in which you can promote your image for people to admire your splendor, your wisdom, your beauty, your glory, your whatever. You took every opportunity, the head of every street, every billboard, every sign, every crossroad, every interaction, every person you thought that had any influence, you promoted yourself. You made your beauty to be a board. Why? Because guess what? A board to who? To God. Even to the people that you think are admiring you, actually, if the Holy Spirit's upon them, they're like, ugh. And you're just like lost and like, oh, everyone loves me. Everyone thinks I'm amazing. Oh, and you walk away from that event and you don't realize that people are just sitting there going, wow, what was that about? <coughs> You offered yourself to everyone who passed by and multiplied your acts of harlotry. In other words, you shamelessly kissed up to them and you thought that they bought the show. And when you walked away, they're all looking at each other just going, what's wrong with this person? Why were they selling them their, themselves so hard? Why were they advertising their goods so intensely? Then they walked away with this weird glow and half smirk of a Mona Lisa smile upon their face, thinking they got away with something, and they're basking in some victory, and we're all looking at you just going, you're kind of a clown. I don't know what you thought you got out of that exchange, but we're not admiring you, and we're not as impressed as you are with you. So verse 26 says, you also committed harlotry with the Egyptians, the secular world. Your very fleshy neighbors. Look that up in Hebrew. I won't get into it. You really got off on them, and you really thought that they have a lot of potency in this world. And so you just really, really, really poured yourself out to any kind of power that you think has potency. Very sensuous, very erotic, very sensual in the soul. And increased your acts of harlotry to do what? Provoke me to anger. So what does this do to God? What does this do to his glory? Are we getting away with anything? No, it provokes God. I'll kind of wrap up with the, these last verses here. Oh, longer than I thought, but this is what we'll do. We'll wrap up. You played the harlot, the Assyrians, the warlike people. You were insatiable. Indeed, you played the harlot with them and still were not satisfied. There's an insatiability problem. We never fill that black hole. It never becomes something we're saying, okay, I've done enough of it. It's just this wantonness until we've just completely poured ourselves out. And then we're just wasted. We're like the prodigal son. We're wasted. We're just like the harlot of the book of Hosea. We're just destroyed and wasted. We're just the used up thing that's just out there, just completely used up. Satan doesn't love you the way we think he's going to love us. Moreover, you multiplied your acts of harlotry as far as the land of the traitor of Chaldea, spiritual harlotry, Chaldeans. Even then, you are not satisfied. How degenerate is what your heart even when you weren't getting anything out of it, you just pursued on in a brazen way unto your own desolation, unto your own destruction. At some point, you became a Kodesh. You embraced your own destruction. At some point, you're saying, well, pedal to the metal. Let's go, Thelma and Houston. Let's drive off in the convertible into the Grand Canyon, giggling with the credits rolling. Seeing that you do all these things, the deeds of a brazen harlot, that's why she's as bronze. She's just hardening herself. She doesn't care. She knows that she's being judged, and at some point, you just hand yourself over. This is a horrible state to be in. You erected your shrine at the head of every road. 
You were an influence to everyone you could. You were an advertisement, a billboard for everyone in every street. You built your high place. You're like a harlot because you scorned payment. Not only were you getting nothing out of it, you didn't even want anything out of it. This is a new level here. Not only do you not get paid and get the benefits from it, you hate it. You don't want it. You've totally sold yourself out for it. You are the way that God scorns payment if you were trying to secure love from God. God scorns that, right? Verse 32, you're an adulterous wife. God has married you who takes strangers instead of her husband. You don't even like the smell. It's, Job says, my wife doesn't even want the smell of my breath, my cologne, my energy, my vibe. She, she's, she cringes around me. She loves the, the cologne of her, of her lovers and the strangeness and uniqueness and the thrill that that is. Men make payment to all harlots, but you made your payments to your lovers and hired them to come to you from all around for your harlotry. And I shared the story before of dealing with my ex-wife and her mother and how she was using her husband in Panama get money from him as he was out here working for $100,000 a year. And she was virtually taking all of his money to say, oh, I'm helping out my family here. And come to find out that after she was murdered, nobody knew that until I went and discovered it, killed by laptop over her head, crowned her with it. That she had nothing, but she kept all her receipts. She was literally paying for men and women to sleep with her by using her husband's money. She was taking the money he was sending her, supposedly building, helping her parents and helping them because she had a handicapped brother, all for these noble purposes. She dies. We go out there to find the body. It takes a week. They kind of played this three-card Monty shell game with the body. We finally find her in the jungles. And then found all the receipts. She was literally paying for clothes, for jewelry, for stereo systems, for dinners. She's paying for her lovers, both men and women. She completely hoard herself out. Nobody paid her. These were low lives that she was paying them to be her lover. For her to be the big shot with her husband's money. How is this not an exact fit to what that wanton spirit is? She even got pregnant by this one lover, this fool. And she died with a four and a half month old baby inside of her. Killed by her, one of her lovers that she spent all of her money on. How is she not a parable to the church? And her daughter, my ex admired her mother for being that way. And she wrote a poem saying, I want to be just like her and I want to walk in her footsteps. And she is in the church now. She has a master's of theology degree and she teaches on podcasts in the church, completely living out the harlotry of her mother's life, which she pledged herself to. And people listen to her. I'm just gobs. I'm just blown away. You are the opposite of other women in your harlotry. Because no one solicited you to be a harlot in that you gave payment, but no payment was given you. Therefore, you're the opposite. You're a harlot and you got the car in reverse. I thought the whole point would be uh, you got paid. No, you are a harlot for harlot's sake. And you're using God's glory, God's resources, God's insights, all this glorious stuff about you're using the name of God. And all the things that you get from a knowledge of God and the word of God and everything else, and you're using it for for like oppo harlotism or whatever you want to call it, anti harlotism. I don't know what to call it. 
Usually harlots are trying to get enriched for it. You're not even getting enriched. You are trying to be a black hole vacuum and you're trying to suck everyone else into that vacuum and you are to be the gates of hell itself. And you're more than happy to do it. Verse 35, now then, O harlot, hear the word of the Lord. I call this the fourth angel of Revelation chapter 18 in which it is a call to the harlot to the super harlot, to the mega harlot, to the uber harlot. Surely, therefore, I will gather all of your lovers with whom you took pleasure, all those you loved, and all those you hated. I will gather them from all around against you and will uncover your nakedness to them that they may see all of your nakedness. And I will judge you as a woman who break wedlock or shed blood are judge and i will bring blood upon you in fury and jealousy this is exactly the eschatological picture of revelation chapter 17 and 18 the fourth the message to god's people this is the part that i don't think we're hearing here the message of revelation 17 and 18 and the 19 the bridegroom comes is to the church the cage of every foul spirit, unclean and hateful bird is the church. It's the warning of this super wanton harlotry that had the closest view of God's splendor and glory that was clothed in God's beauty, who became a harlot that has no payoff, who was on the road to super destruction and has switched off her brain and has gone into an intoxicated mode of the wine of Babylon, who has given herself fully over to her wantonness. The last intervention to God of this mentality is in Revelation chapter 18, where it says, come out of her, my people, be not partaker of her destruction. This is a super intervention. It's called the great loud cry, the fourth message of the bridegroom, crying out to the bride. Christ is the fourth angel. He's the center branch candlestick in which the three angels' message of Revelation 14 are, are hung upon. His side in which the bride comes out of, as you will see in a seven branch candlestick, that is this picture of him trying to minister to his bride that is on a full-on suicide mission. The church is in a suicide mission because she's handed herself over to the super harlotry that's being talked about here in Ezekiel chapter 16. She has handed herself over to such a path of self-destruction in which she has literally given herself over to be as a Kodesh to Lucifer. This is God in his mercy screaming woes to her as Christ was screaming woes to the Pharisees. Don't be destroyed. Turn from this. So it's a loud cry. Revelation, I'm excuse me, uh, Ezekiel 16 verse 44 says, indeed, everyone who quotes Proverbs will use this proverb against you like mother, like daughter. You see the Revelation 17, the mother of harlots, Babylon and daughter. Look, this was the iniquity of your sister Sodom. Wait a minute. I thought he's talking to Jerusalem. Yeah, to Sodom and Egypt. She and her daughter had pride, fullness of food, rich and increase of goods, have need of nothing. And she doesn't see her, she doesn't see her problem. She doesn't see what the problem is. What, what, what? and abundance of idleness. Neither did she strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy. Who are the poor and the needy? We just think it's just homeless people. It's those who come into the church that are crying to know God, and it's turned into one giant fashion show, one giant runway model for a bunch of glory hogs that have filled the church, and they're trying to turn everyone into an audience, a television audience for themselves. And they were haughty and committed abomination before me. Therefore, I took them away as I saw fit. Verse 52, you who judged your sisters, bear your own shame. You're too busy looking at everyone else as the harlot, remnant church. 
delicate, beautiful woman that so much would not put her feet upon the ground. And he comes knocking and you won't get up and answer the door because you don't want to defile yourself. Please look up the reference to those verses. Behold, I stand at the door and knock, but you don't want to get up because you don't want to see how filthy you really are. You're comfortable in your bed. You're too busy judging other people and you don't judge yourself. Bear your own shame because the sins which you committed were more abominable than theirs. We want to judge everyone else. Why don't we look at ourselves? They are more righteous than you. They have less light than you do in the face of so much light. We're so delicate, but we are the cannibals. We are devouring our own children. This is the most cursed. This is the delicate woman that won't put her feet upon the ground. That Deuteronomy that Moses is talking about and the curses. We think we are so precious, so beautiful. How are we guilty? We're reaching a crease of goods. We have need of nothing. Pride, idleness, presumption. Yes, be disgraced. Where's your shame? Where's your blush? Bear your own shame because you justified your sisters. You have found excuses for this nonsense in your church. Verse 54, that you may bear your own shame and be disgraced by all that you did when you did what comforted them, gave them rationale and justification for all of this. That's what makes your sin so great. You have paid for your lewdness and your abominations, says the Lord. Nevertheless, I will remember my covenant. Here's the repentance, you guys. This is the hope for the harlot. This is what I want to end with. I want to end with the fact that there is hope. It's not just the doom and the gloom and the destruction and the condemnation and the shame. God is telling you to turn to repent, to return to your husband, to go back to this place of of simplicity and humility, of a primitive love and a trust and nakedness before God. Leave off everything else. Leave off your jewelry. Leave off your arrogance. Leave off your display. Leave off your self-glorification. Leave off your self-promotion. Leave off all of this dancing and prancing and parading and needing attention and supposedly that you are needing this splendor to be attributed to your great wisdom and your great beauty and your great what what is so great about us do you know who's great and who the only one that i know is great god is great god is great the zombie apocalypse that needs to be worshiped right now God, it's it's absolutely we need to abandon that that parade of presumptuous horror. The march into the lake of fire, the march into hell that that is. Verse 6, he says, nevertheless, I will remember my covenant, the everlasting gospel, the return to an everlasting righteousness in which God has pledged himself to you in an everlasting covenant with you in the days of your youth. And I will establish an everlasting covenant with you. Remember from where he, when you were gurgling in your own blood, that you were cast off as an abortion, born out of place, stillborn, dead in your trespasses and sin. Remember that. Don't forget that. He'll take you back there in the valley. Verse 61, then you will remember your ways and you'll be ashamed. It's okay for you to now remember that we are so sick that we jump off into this presumptuous Luciferian self-worshipping splendor and glory hog weirdness that we get into. And really, it doesn't take much other than just to be a little bit unguarded, a little bit unwatchful. That we just spring right into action if we just kind of give ourselves half a second to do it. We will do it. And then we're going to just lay the reins of our passions upon the neck of the presumption of our lusts and think we're going to be safe with whatever that destination is. The wild horses of our own lusts is not safe. When you receive your older and your younger sisters, for I will give them to you for daughters, but not because of my covenant with you. And I will establish my covenant with you. 
then you shall know that I am the Lord. I am your life. I am your reality. But listen to the next verses here because a lot of people don't like this, but this is the day of atonement. I just want to forget about those things and I just want to move on and I just want to start all over again. And then we begin our our false repentance and our road right back to the shamefulness and we rebuild what God has destroyed. So let's back up and let God destroy this. He says, verse 62, I will establish my covenant with you, right? You'll know that I am the Lord for what? That you may remember, this is the affliction. This is the reminder. This is so we don't forget. We want it to be remembered at every, at every crossroad, the head of every street, every high place. We want to be memorialized. Well, God says there, we're going to put pictures of your shame. That you may remember and be ashamed. Our problem is that we lack shame. We lack the shame. When we're at that level of harlotry, we have to have shame infused into us because we became an alcoholic of shamelessness. And never open your mouth anymore because of your shame when I provide you an atonement for all that you have done says the Lord. This is the mandate from heaven. That is for your affliction. That is for your humility. It doesn't matter that everyone has known you as Rahab. Everyone has known you as Mary Magdalene. That's okay. That's going to help you remain in a place of humility, and I will cover you and cloak you with my splendor and my righteousness. So, based on that, as we sum up this talk, I know it's a little longer than usual. I think it was worth every second as we're wrapping up this study. Hebrews 12, verse 25 to 29 says, See that you refuse not him who speaks from this great throne bejeweled fiery mountain. For if they escaped not who refused him that spoke on earth, much more shall not we escape. Nobody's getting out of this with some exception to the rule mentality. We turn away from him that speaks from heaven. The great authority and the throne room and the orientation in which God who rules all things and all things are beneath his feet. He has the final say so of everything. It's an inescapable reality and authority that God has coming from his throne room. Those, excuse me, whose voice then shook the earth, but now he have promised saying, yet once more, I shake not the earth only, but also heaven. This is the language of Isaiah chapter six, in which there are seraphim surrounding him saying, holy, 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 the Lord God almighty, worship the lamb, him who is slain from the foundation of the world, the goodness of God that you despised, let it now be the badge of your humility and trust and obedience in the bridegroom. He humbled himself to save the proud whore. Take off your jewelry. Take off your makeup. Take off your whore clothes. Dress yourself in humility. Be quiet and humble, trusting under my wing. Church. Church. And this word, yet once more, signifies the removing of those things that are shaken as of things that are made. The things of this world and the, and the vain pursuits and the elemental things and all the things that we chase and the principalities and powers and the significance, the validation, the touch not, handle not, taste not, and all these tangibilities of this world in which we think are so great, these things that are made. These things that God says that things that can be shaken will be shaken. In the end, you're going to find out that the only thing that's going to stand is Christ and his righteousness, the eternal perfection and substance of who he is, and everything else will be brought to powder before the presence of his glory. Everything will be melted and shaken and taken down to nothing in the presence of his splendor and his glory. We forget that. We don't remember that. We've lost sight of that. The church has lost sight of that. Preaching has lost sight of that. Ministers have lost sight of that. The congregation has lost sight of that. 
Some angels lost sight of that. Covering cherub lost sight of that. That those things which cannot be shaken may remain. Who remains? Those that are hid in him who is eternal and forever Christ. No one remains outside of them being, quote, mistaken, covered, and having the imputation and being cloaked with somebody else's reality of righteousness. Those are the only people who remain. Wherefore, we receive a kingdom that which cannot be moved like the everlasting hills, who is Christ himself, the rock. Let us have grace whereby, remember the stone of grace? Christ. Whereby we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear, for our God is a consuming fire. The glory of God who shall stand. It's like a furnace, like a heat. Nothing will stand. Nothing will stand before the glory of God. And yet it's the same glory that you saw the lamb slain, burning. A burning lamb is what you saw on the altar. You want to see the glory of God? See a lamb burning in the midst of an altar and you will see the glory of God. Despise that goodness. See him in weakness. Think that you can presume upon such tender glory as if it is of no consequence to prevail over the meekness and the humility of God, as if that is something to prevail over, that's the beginning of sin. That is the core of sin. That is the root of all sin. That is the wicked, covetous eye that believes that it can be God and above God. Nobody's above God. And the humility of God is the crowning diadem of his throne. His humility is not to be despised. His goodness is not to be despised. His meekness is not to be despised. His humility is not to be despised. This is the foundation of God's throne. All right, guys, that's it for our study. Thanks for being a part of this study. Please uh, uh, study this stuff out, making sure it's true that I'm not making this stuff up and that I didn't exaggerate in anything, that I didn't twist the scriptures in any way that the scripture and the word of God was rightly represented here. Pray that that is so. I pray that... I pray that we study these things to see if these things are so, that we're all good Bereans, that nothing was misrepresented here. Because I believe that there is a message that's coming, and this is just, you're just catching early glimpses of this before it really sets off where God is going to cry to his church, cry to the harlot who has become so wanton and so rich in increase of goods, so filled with the delicacies and with all the ornamentalism and the drunkenness of her presumption of not needing Christ. She's like a widow. She wipes her mouth and she sees nothing wrong and she's fine. She's got the heartless forehead and she's not touched. She's not blushing. Her heart is hardened. She's brazen. How is God going to break that powerful spell? Well, it's about to happen. It's about to happen. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I know it's the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, and it will be a loud cry to weep between the porch and the altar, and a deep repentance that is a crashing, astonishing repentance that is an astonishing thing to watch. It will be a spectacle before the whole world. Pray for this to be so. God bless.